Hello, Mati and I are excited to welcome you to day number four of our ACM YSEC 2021 program. We will continue the interesting program that we had yesterday, where we had two technical sessions on side channel attacks as well as on physical tracking, where our demo and poster session happened on Gethertown, and where we had our panel on digital vaccination passports. In case you missed the panel yesterday, be invited to watch it on YouTube, where a recording of it is available. For today, Right after these introductory notes, we will continue with session number nine on cellular communication security that will be chaired by Katarina Coles. We will then continue with our awards ceremony where the best paper award as well as the best demo and best poster awards will be handed out by the technical program committee chairs. And then we will continue with our third keynote by Malik Tatipamula, who will be talking about securing next generation wireless networks. As you can see, we have some focus on 5G and next generation wireless networks, cellular networks today. Then afterwards, session number 10 will happen on authentication and authorization, and it will be chaired by Kevin Butler. Before the end of the day, we will continue with, we will start with the tutorials and here I hand over to Mati. Thank you, Christina. So today we'll indeed end by our first YSEC tutorial. On this tutorial will be on SDR on GNU radio. Tomorrow we will continue with several more tutorials and these tutorials have been organized by Jiska Klaassen. If you want to watch these tutorials, you can use the existing Zoom link that you are using right now. And you can also use the existing YouTube stream that you, are, that you may be watching right now. In parallel to the WISEC tutorials, we will also have the WISEML workshop. If you want to attend this workshop, you have to register for a separate Zoom link. After the WISEML workshop, you can also find a recording of this workshop online on YouTube. During these two parallel events, you can also switch between both sessions and you can find the timings of these sessions on our website. With that, I would like to hand off to Katarina Kols, who will be sharing the next session on cellular communication security. Hello everyone, um, welcome to the cellular security session. Um, I'm Katarina Kols, I'm from Rat Hello, Mati and I, are excited to welcome you to day number four of our ACM YSEC 2021 program. We will continue the interesting program that we had yesterday where we had two technical sessions on side channel attacks as well as on physical tracking, where our demo and poster session happened on Gethertown and where we had our panel on digital vaccination passports. In case you missed the panel yesterday, be invited to watch it on YouTube where a recording of it is available. For today, right after these introductory notes, we will continue with session number nine on cellular communication. Hello, my name is Norbert Ludant. I am a PhD student at Northeastern University, and I am going to present our work, which introduces SIG under an attack able to overshadow crucial initial access system information in 5G cellular networks using a low power signal. 5G, the fifth generation of wireless communications, is the most comprehensive cellular system to date. Apart from improvements in network capacity and latency, it is flexible and extensible, with slices to support a variety of unique application requirements, from massive IoT to ultra-reliable low latency. Furthermore, the incorporation of a service-based architecture and network function virtualization is very promising to adequately support critical applications such as self-driving driving cars, robotics and remote surgeries. Given the crucial applications, one of the promises of 5G is to increase security, privacy and robustness. For instance, 5G encrypts the subscriber private identity to prevent sending in the clear and supports false base station detection. However, 5G is still designed to streamline discovery and initiate connection with limited computation and communications costs. This has significant implications for robustness, security and privacy, as one of the consequences is that initial access signals are still unprotected, which enables vulnerabilities such as our attack, SIG under. The presentation is structured as follows. First, useful technical background about 5G initial access procedures presented, 
which will aid in understanding the vulnerability. Then, we introduce our attack, SIG under, and we discuss the enablers of the attack, the challenges of carrying out the attack and its implications. The experimental setup and results section will describe our measurement setup and summarize our findings. Lastly, I will describe our proposed mitigation, SIG under, which is able to reduce the efficacy of SIG under and similar attacks. 5G uses a set of always-on signals for initial access, grouped in the synchronization signal block, SSB. This block consists of primary and secondary synchronization signals, PSS and SSS, physical broadcast channel, PVCH, and the modulation reference signal, DMRS. SSB is transmitted in four contiguous OFDM symbols across 240 subcarriers, and for initial access selection, the UE, UE assumes a 20 millisecond SSB's periodicity. PSS and SSS are well-known signals that the UE looks for during cell search for time and frequency synchronization, generally by correlating with the set of known signals. After that initial step, the demodulation reference signal DMRS is used as pilot for channel estimation to equalize PVCH. Finally, PVCH carries the master information block, MIB, which contains crucial network configuration information and is the focus of our attack. MIB is a block of 23 bits which includes vital information for network access, such as system frame number, subcarrier spacing used, or where in spectrum to find further system information. As such, 5G MIB is encoded in the PVCH with extreme care. As seen in the block diagram, 23 bits of MIB plus 1 bit of BCH, 24 bits, become 864 bits after interleaving and scrambling, and strong channel coding which makes this block very robust due to its low rate. Moreover, 5G New Radio is the first cellular standard that introduces polar coding for control channels. The use of very low rate polar coding for PVCH further increases the robustness against noise and interference. However, such codes are not designed to protect from a, from a smart adversary. In a nutshell, SIG under is an attack that transmits a set, subset of the subcarriers of OFDM modulated symbols to overshadow the original transmission at the receiver. We focus on the capabilities of overshadowing PVCH due to the relevance of the information it carries, the low rate coding, and the predictability of both the timing and the contents of MIB PVCH. Sigander explores the MIB space to find how many PVCH symbols differ between a target and legitimate MIB. We find that modifying one bit from the MIB can lead to the resulting spoof PVCHs who have a similitude with the original PVCH between 18 and 37% symbols. Exploring the complete MIB space, we find that this value can increase up to 54% PVCH symbols being equal, translating in roughly 3 dB less power. In this way, deciding the target MIB used to overshadow is a trade-off between stealthiness, energy efficiency, and purpose of the attack. The attack overview is as follows. First, the adversary uses the legitimate SSB to synchronize with the base station and decode the MIB to spoof. After that, it chooses a target MIB different from the legitimate MIB and performs the PVCH encoding process. Then, it identifies the subset of symbols that differ with the legitimate signal, as PVCH is highly predictable. The symbols correspond to the subcarriers that will be spoofed by the adversary. The adversary transmits only the given subset of PVCH symbols, synchronized with the g b transmission at a power level slightly higher to cancel the legitimate g b trans transmission and barely flip the QPSK symbol at the receiver UE. The receiver receives the additively combined signals at the same time instant. The addition of both signals over the air results in the error correction capabilities of polar code decoding the malicious PVCH even at low SNR. The choice of spoofed MIB from the attacker can lead, for instance, to setting the cell barred field to 1, stopping users from connecting to the cell, or to leading the UEs to decoding subsequent spoofed system information, enabling further attacks. Carrying out the attack in a real scenario presents a set of challenges. As SIG under relies on legitimate and forged symbols adding to a desired signal, both need to be synchronized at the UE. 5G new radio choice of waveform, or FDM, includes a cyclic prefix to combat multipath and simplify equalization. We find experimentally that the attack is effective as long as the timing offset is below the CP duration, which corresponds 
to a range of 1.4 kilometers and 600 meters for the subcarrier spaces used for sub 6 gigahertz communications. Due to the imperfections in the crystals driving the PLL generating the carrier frequency, an offset typically exists. In order to align the phase correctly at the receiver, the attacker needs to track the phase offset with the G0B. -B. We propose to use a polynomial regression model to predict the phase offset at the upcoming overshadowing opportunity. Lastly, SSB includes DMRS signal for PVCH symbol equalization. We found that if the adversary includes PVCH DMRS in its transmission, the received signal reflects better the joint channel and increases the probability of a successful overshadowing. We evaluate our attack through simulations and over-the-air measurements. For our simulation evaluation, we test SIG under with MATLAS software through Monte Carlo simulations. On the other hand, for real-world measurements over the air, we use high-performance software-defined radios, specifically USRP X310, for RF transmission and reception. We use 5G opener interface, 5G new radio open source implementation, to generate SSB and transmit it over USRP X310. We record the transmitted signals from another USRP X310 and perform our attack over the recorded signals. One of the first issues encountered by an attacker is to determine which phase rotations of the attacker's signal result in legitimate an attacker's signals adding up to obtain the desired signal at the receiver. We apply different phase rotation at the attacker's signal and we compute the probability of success in overshadowing or jamming the legitimate signals. We find that the attack is more consistent when DMRS is sent. Moreover, only around 11% of the signals are able to overshadow when the attacker is 5.0 5 dB below. But this value increases to almost 60% faces able to either overshadow or jam when power is increased by 3 dB, suggesting that the number of users impacted decreases with the attack power. In addition, due to CFO, the phase between the G not B and the attacker changes over time and needs to be adjusted, especially when the percentage of faces able to overshadow it, shadow is reduced. We find that the measured values of phase difference do not vary drastically for consecutive SSVs most of the time, as the period between two given blocks is relatively small, 20 milliseconds. We find that a polynomial estimator of order 2 with a windowing of the last five phase differences can achieve an error below 2% 96% of the time, and the error does not exceed 4%. From our results, we find that there is a discrepancy between the simulation and real-world results due to the challenges of performing the attack on a real channel. In simulations, we find that the attacker's signal can be around 8 dB below and still successful, whereas this value becomes between 3 and 4 dB for over-the-air measurements. Our results for the over-the-air setup show that even though transmitting PVC ATMRS increases the total power used for the attack, the attack becomes more reliable, and our attack is able to overshadow 100% of the times at 3.8 dB below with perfect phase estimation. On the other hand, the difference on the performance of the attack with our phase estimate reduces the capabilities of the attack by only between 0.4 and 0.7 dB compared to a perfect phase estimation, as our phase estimation error is generally very low. In this way, our attack is able to overshadow the legitimate MIB 100% of the time, being 3.4 dB below the legitimate signal. A very low power attack can be achieved by transmitting only PVCH, even at 6 dB below. However, the attack is not stable and is able to overshadow 20% of the time. In order to fully mitigate overshadowing attacks, two things are required. A physical layer mechanism to recover an overshadowed signal and integrity protection. Successive interference cancellation fits the, fits the requirement of recovering an overshadow signal. However, although it fares well with classic overshadowing, it is not fit for subcarrier selective overshadowing, because our psych under signal is not a complete valid PVCH. We propose two SIC based schemes adapted to this particular case partial SIC and equalized SIC. For the first scheme, the decoded signal is not subtracted in its entirety, but only an amplitude scaled down version of it is subtracted. As the weight applied can be variable, we propose a simple iterative heuristic which increases the decoding overhead linearly with the number of iterations. As for the second scheme, it is a scheme that specially con specifically considers an active attacker focusing on a set of subcarriers. 
Thus, it explores the frequency domain, PVC8 symbols, to identify the subcarriers that have experienced an abnormal modification and equalizes the resulting PVC8 symbols by only applying SIC to ad identify subcarriers. Our results show that traditional SIC does not improve the probability of recovering the original transmission, and the probability of recovering the MIB increases substantially when our two schemes are combined. In fact, the mitigation is able to retrieve the original MIB 34% of the times when the power of the attacker is the same as the legitimate signal, representing a gain of more than 3.6 dB respect to not using SIC. All right, um, thanks for this very first presentation of the session. Um, we will directly go over to the second presentation, so we'll later have time for questions. Our second paper is called Comprehensive Formal Analysis of 5G Handover. So this will be presented by Alexi Peltonen, and that is a uh, joint work with Ralf Sasse and David Bezin. And it's a collaboration between the Aalto University in Finland and the ETH Zurich in Switzerland. So this formal analysis will be a paper that extracts security properties from the 5G specification, which is, um, I, I think, a big job on its own, and then having a formal verification of the 5G handover um, procedure. Um, so there are many new use cases coming with 5G, a lot of car-to-car uh, -car communication, all that stuff. So we will have a lot of uh, handovers there because it's a mobile network. So it's particularly interesting to see how secure um, the handover procedure is and to have something that gives us a formal analysis of that security. So I hand over now to the presentation of this second paper. Hello everyone and welcome to this presentation introducing our work on 5G handovers. My name is Alexi Belton and I'm a doctoral candidate at Aalto University and I will be giving you this talk on behalf of myself and my co-authors from ETH Zurich. We're going to start the presentation with a brief introduction to protocol development, formal methods and 5G handovers, followed by a summary of our contributions and main results in this project. Let's begin with talking a bit about what a typical standardization process might look like. Many widely deployed network protocols, such as TLS and 5G, are often developed by standardization organizations, such as IETF or 3GPP. Once the initial development phase is completed, the protocol is typically released as a standard, which is then deployed and released for consumers. This is, of course, just a simplified generalization of reality, since in many cases, standards such as 5G may already be to some extent deployed in the middle of the standardization process and track the development iterations. After initial deployment, more often than not, someone eventually discovers a flaw in the protocol, allowing malicious entities to exploit vulnerabilities, which then need to be corrected by the developers of the protocol. This can be a very lengthy and time-consuming process which is especially dangerous if there already are consumers using these protocols for real-world purposes. However, by introducing formal methods into the standardization phase, many of these attacks can be discovered and prevented already before deployment. In this project, we decided to use a state-of-the-art verification tool called Hammer Improver for symbolic analysis and verification of the 5G standard. In a symbolic model, we assume perfect cryptography, meaning that without proper keys, an adversary or honest participant is incapable of decrypting messages. We also assume that the encryption methods are flawless and correctly implemented. The adversary following the dollar yaw model is an active attacker controlling the entire underlying network. In other words, we expect the attacker to intercept all messages and to be able to delete, modify, replay, and spoof messages, provided that they have access to the relevant cryptographic keys. The protocol itself is encoded in a formal language, 
and the desired attributes as reachability or equivalence properties, but more on that later. Given all of this, Tamarin explores the state space and tries to find counter examples to the claim properties. And if a state disproving a property is discovered, the search terminates and Tamarin returns a trace name to it. The part of the 5G standard we chose to analyze are the handover protocols. A handover is used to transfer an ongoing data connection between two networks, which can either both be implemented in the same standard or different compatible standards. For 5G at the moment, the only inter 5G handovers specified are between 5G and 4G. Since we're talking about transferring an ongoing data connection, the handover must be fast, reliable, seamless, and most importantly, secure enough to not compromise the security level achieved by initial key derivation. Furthermore, the protocols also include multiple participants, such as the user equipment, both the old and the new network, as well as the core networks. Because of this, the procedures are rather complex. So why are we also analyzing fallback methods to 4G? Well, according to Ericsson's mobility report from last November, we're currently at the very beginning of a lengthy process moving from 4G and to 5G. In fact, the 4G user base is currently predicted to continue growing at least until the end of 2021, after which 5G slowly starts taking over. However, as you can see, we are for the foreseeable future looking at an ecosystem with a mixture of these different standards. And for this reason, we believe it is especially important during the first 5 to 10 years that interconnectivity between 5G and 4G works and provides the same security as simply doing intra 5G handovers. Our main contributions in this project can be summarized as follows. First of all, we identify a set of relevant specifications for the handover protocols as well as for the supporting infrastructure. Out of the hundreds of relevant existing standardization documents, we found a total of nine specifications describing four different handover protocols, two intra 5G and two inter 5G variations used for backwards compatibility. The main challenge here was both the quantitative complexity of the specifications and also the fact that handovers are embedded in a much more comprehensive architecture from which we had to delimit the relevant parts. Second, we formalized and formally modeled these protocols in Tamarin Prover. This included designing on the development level of abstraction, creating and optimizing models, and analyzing the correctness of these models using various modeling techniques. Finally, using the models and the results from Tamarin, we performed a security analysis of all four handovers. Now, the 5G specification does not explicitly state any security goals for handovers, but the implicit goal is to at least maintain the same level of security as achieved prior to a handover. For this reason, we decided to use the security goals of the key agreement protocol 5G ATA as our starting point. Naturally, the main goal of a handover could be summarized as simply handing over a device from one network to another. This can then further be divided into a subset of tasks, such as driving new keys, exchanging parameters, updating the core network, etc. etc. Based on this knowledge, we focused our analysis on verifying the correctness of key agreement properties as well as analyzing the secrecy of newly derived keys. Our first goal was to verify key agreement properties. To put it simply, key agreement means that involved parties should all agree on the results of negotiations or other key updates. If, for example, the user equipment and the target network derive a new session key, 
then they should injectively agree on that key. In other words, an adversary should not be able to trick an honest participant to update its key without an honest counterpart. Honesty, in this context, refers to the fact that an entity has not been compromised previously. As this was not true, the adversary would already be in possession of some, if not all, of the keys, making the analysis of the protocols obsolete. A particularly important aspect for us was to analyze an arbitrary number of consecutive handover protocols between any number of network devices and networks in order to ensure that misplanning is not possible. The other aspect of interest, secrecy, simply means that any keys pre-existing or recently derived should only be known by authorized parties. For this part, we took all the keys and other secrets that were either directly sent over the network encrypted or not, or that were derived using parameters that were sent over the network. As previously mentioned, we used a standard Dolan Yellow style attacker, which controls the entire underlying network. This means that anything sent between the participants always goes through the attacker. However, in order to get any results at all, we of course had to assume that some messages eventually get delivered. Otherwise, a persistent denial of service attacker could simply drop all messages and prevent the protocol run entirely. Furthermore, we also allowed the adversary to compromise any number of devices and networks to be used in the attacks. The output of our work consists of four tampering models with properties analyzing key agreement and secrecy in handover protocols. In addition to the properties of interest, we use various auxiliary techniques to ensure the correctness of our models. We also wrote some highly optimized scripts called oracles in Tamarin for guiding the verification tool to terminate as quickly as possible. All of these are available online in the Tamarin GitHub repository, to which there will be a QR code and a URL at the end of the presentation. Using our models and Tamarin, we show that after a successful handover, injective agreement holds for all nearly derived keys, provided that none of the participating agents or secure channels have been compromised or have leaked any secret information. In addition to key agreement properties, we also prove that all keys used or derived during the handover remain secret. Furthermore, for each key, we infer the minimum requirements for the secrecy to hold. In the interest of time, I will not be going into any further details about these requirements as understanding them would require an explanation of the different keys and interfaces. However, you can find a detailed analysis of the results, as well as all the required background knowledge in the paper. To conclude my talk, I would like to encourage you to check out the publication or the extended author version in case you're interested in the details of our work or simply want to learn more about handover protocols or formal methods. As mentioned previously, we also made all the tampering models available together with instructions for reproducing the results. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot for the second presentation. Um, just as a reminder in the middle of the session, if you have questions, you can already ask them on Slack and maybe give us some thumbs up. Um, if you like a question, so it's getting easier later in the Q&A. Um, and now we'll continue with the third paper. So the third paper is called 5G Sushi Catcher, Still Catching Them All. This will be presented by Merlin Kloster, and that's joint work with David Ruprecht, Christina Pöpper, and Thorsten Holz. And it's collaboration between the Ruhr University in Bochum in Germany and the New York University in Abu Dhabi. So this paper is interesting because IMSI catchers, that's a problem that we know from earlier mobile generations, and that's something that should have been solved in 5G. 
But now it turns out that there are still some problems and that it's possible, and we see a proof of work in this paper, that it's still possible to link identities and in the end conduct an IMSI catcher like attack. So I'll hand over now for the third presentation about the 5G sushi catchers. Hi, my name is Marlon. I work for RUB University in a team on mobile network security. And today I want to present our work on one of 5G's new privacy features that tries to defeat IMSI catchers. So if we look at the mobile network, of course, we all have the smartphone in our pockets. And uh, on the network side, we have the base stations that provide the wireless coverage and a core network that performs management tasks. Now, your smartphone needs to identify somehow and uh, therefore it has a subscriber ID and a key stored on the SIM card. Now in mobile networks, that identifier usually is the, the IMSI. Uh, that is a number that tells the network uh, which operator you're registered with and some kind of, um, some kind of custom ID. Now, uh, 5G also has the possibility um, for a uh, user app domain style, style identifier and um, both together is called the SUPI. Um, but that is only important uh, because, because of the name change. In this talk, we can just assume that we're still working with an IMSI that identifies the smartphone. Now, what happens if your smartphone joins the network? There is a simple protocol that identifies your smartphone with the IMSI. Um, only after that, encryption kicks in because first the network has to look up um, your keys using that IMSI. So the first part of this protocol is a plain text protocol. Now what happens if there is a IMSI catcher nearby? So an IMSI catcher is a fake base station that impersonates the real network and at this stage of the protocol the smartphone can't tell if it's the real network or an IMSI catcher. So basically the same protocol runs and the smartphone discloses the identity, the IMSI, to the IMSI catcher. And then the IMSI catcher can lock that you were at, uh, within the range at the given time. And this is something that is, for example, used by uh, law enforcement. So 5G has a new privacy feature that is called Sushi to encrypt the plain text identity. Basically, on the SIM card, you have an operator's public key stored and together with an ephemeral key that is generated by the smartphone, you can encrypt the plain text SUPI or plain text IMSI. Now, what happens if you identify to, um, to an IMSI catcher? Of course, the protocol doesn't change. So you still disclose the, uh, the identity, but now the identity is encrypted. What is also um, very handy about this protocol is that the, um, uh, on every use, the sushi is regenerated. So now the, the IMSI catcher cannot tell if uh, two separate users uh, just arrived or if, uh, if the same user um, reappeared. So this feature will basically prevent IMSI catchers from, uh, from collecting the plain text identity of all the users nearby. So what is not possible anymore is to directly ask the smartphone for its identity because you get the, the encrypted identity back. But what is still possible through other attacks is to, um, to ask to probe the smartphone for one specific identity. So in this example, you could ask, are you Merlin? And the smartphone would leak um, if it belongs to me or not. Now we are gonna have a look at uh, this type of attack today. Um, this, this style of attack is more intrusive, it scales worse, and um, it also requires cooperation from the smartphone and the network. So um, they weren't, these type of attacks weren't practical before. But um, the question is, are they, are they now practical since we have sushi and can't use the way easier style of identification anymore? So of course you can't ask the smartphone if it belongs to Merlin, um, but what you can do is you can probe for an old sushi, for an old identity. And um, 
well, deriving, uh, gathering this, uh, this old identity basically is detective's work. I mean, you can observe the, the smartphones that come in and then at a later point, you want to identify if, uh, if somebody returned or, uh, or not. So we're going to have a look at uh, this linking attack. Um, what happens is um, you're, when, you're, uh, when a smartphone with a new identity, so an unknown smartphone with an unknown sushi, um, comes into range of the, of the IMSI catcher, well, it cannot tell the identity. But now what happens, um, the, the attacker will replace the, uh, the new sushi by the old identity and request an uh, authentication from the, from the network. Now, this authentication request is associated with the old identity. The attacker forwards it to the smartphone and then two cases can happen. Um, so, it could happen that um, you get an authentication failure back. That is because the smartphone is not associated with the, with the old identity and hence the authentication request is invalid. But it can also happen that the uh, smartphone response with an authentication, with a successful authentication, and then you know that the smartphone is indeed associated with that old sushi, despite it tried to register with a regenerated new sushi. So let's have a look at the experiments that we performed. So we built a 5G network and bought a 5G phone, and the 5G phone can connect over, well, over 5G new radio, to the standalone 5G core network. The core network is based on Amerisoft and we built an attacker uh, using free 5 gc and the Amerisoft base station. So the first step that we did is to validate the attack. So that was described in, uh, in theory before and we could validate that this attack actually runs in an all, all 5G setup. Now we also performed some modifications on this tag that allow it to be repeated. So um, now instead of just asking the smartphone, are you Merlin? You can ask, are you Merlin? Are you Alice? Are you Bob? And we were able to, uh, to repeat that for up to 500 identities. Um, we wanted to know how well the attack scales and that also means how, how fast the attack can, can run in a network. So what we did is that we speed tested the, uh, the components involved and we saw that, for example, for the, uh, for the SIM card, uh, we could send about 800 requests a minute and for the modem, we could send about 500 requests a minute. So. Um, because the tech is limited by the slowest component involved, that means that we can uh, run the 500 identity tests in just a minute. So of course, that doesn't directly translate to real networks. So we wanted to find out how it will look like when um, well, commercial networks adopt the Sushi feature in 5G. So we performed uh, speed tests in commercial 4G networks. Uh, to see if the operators already employ rate limiting. And uh, well, we found that um, on the SIM card, the speeds vary greatly. So some are rate limited, some uh, don't seem uh, rate limited. But on the network side, all of the three networks that we tested had quite heavy rate limiting. So that means that um, while the attack could work there, um, it is um, it wouldn't scale that well, and it would be uh, uh, and it would be slowed down by the rate limiting. To sum it up, we think that the um, that the sushi feature will likely defeat IMSI catchers as we know them today. Still, small scale identification of specific users could still be practical. So therefore, we think that if, uh, if operators choose to deploy the Sushi feature, they should also have a look at rate limiting the authentication. Okay, thanks a lot for the third presentation. We'll now come to the final paper. Uh, the title of that is on the challenges of automatory construction in LTE networks. 
We will again see Merlin presenting this work and it's joint work with David Ruprecht and Thorsten Holz. And this is uh, a team from Ruhr University in Bochum. And this final talk for today um, will be about, it's a bit like the opposite side from the formalization that we saw before. So now it's coming from the implementation side and learning the state machines in a specific implementation of the mobile network and then analyzing that specific implementation to find security issues and vulnerabilities. So I'll hand over for this final presentation of the session today. And then after that, we will come to the Q&A session. Hi, my name is Merlin and I'm part of the mobile security team at RUB University. And today I wanna to show you how we use automata reconstruction to perform testing in LTE networks. So let's have a look at mobile networks in general. So you always have the base stations that provide the wireless coverage and a core network that is responsible for the management. So when your smartphone enters the network, it first establishes a radio link to the base stations. Now we can just assume that the RRC protocol performs a job and the wireless connection just works. What we are interested in is the user management protocol, the NAS protocol. The, um, on the, in the core network, the NAS protocol is handled by the mobility management entity, in short, MME. That server basically is the gatekeeper to the, uh, to the mobile network. So the, uh, the MME decides which users are, uh, are denied from the network and which can join. Now, um, within the MME, the, um, the MME keeps track of all the users with some state machine. And um, of course, initially, the, any user doesn't have, um, doesn't have internet ac access, of course. It first needs to identify and to authenticate. So through these procedures, the users can move through that state machine and, uh, well, eventually end up in a state with an, with an internet connection. Yeah. So, I think the, uh, the most important part here is that the MME is directly exposed to, to everybody because um, since the, the MME is the gatekeeper, it must e evaluate all the new users that join, no matter uh, if, uh, if they are already authenticated or not. So anybody with, for example, a software-defined radio could connect to the, to the network and then send um, malicious NAS mess messages to the MME. So it is very important that the MME is implemented correctly. Now, what we were interested in was we would uh, we, we want to see if there are any logical errors within the, the state machine. So for example, we want to see if it is possible to bypass the authentication step. So of course, in real networks, we don't really know how that uh, state machine is implemented. And uh, so the question for us was, uh, how, can we, how can we come up with smart test cases? Now, the thing is here that, um, of course, the state machine is way more complex than, uh, than the small diagram. And uh, actually, it is, uh, it, is, it is very complex. So there are many features in the, uh, in the LTE standard. And um, well, they're all somehow in that state machine. So for us, it was very difficult to come up with um, uh, with test cases, and sometimes it was even um, very hard to understand what is the intended um, behavior from the standard. So um, we we thought uh, we thought that we need to have some way that allows us to do automated testing in a in an OPEC box approach uh, that doesn't require uh, understanding the standard very well. Yeah. So let's have a look at what we what we know. So we know that the MME has some kind of state machine that keeps track of the users and we roughly know the inputs. So we know that um, the inputs and outputs to that state machine that is messages from the identification procedure, authentication procedure and so on. So um, we had a look at a technique called st uh, automata reconstruction. Um, automata reconstruction can derive melee automata by sending, uh, sending input and observing the output from the system. Now, uh, luckily there are already uh, libraries that perform such tasks. In our case, we were using uh, LearnLib. 
So LearnLib starts with an, uh, with an empty hypothesis about the system, and then by sending messages to the system and observing it, it will, um, it will recover the state machine. So of course, LearnLib by itself doesn't know any about LTE protocols. So uh, we need to have a component that performs the translation. Uh, in more detail, it needs to perform the input message generation, the interpretation of the responses, and a general uh, reliable interface to the MME. So what we chose is to use uh, SRS LTE components, um, some, of, uh, some of which um, are smartphone components and some of which are base station components. So um, very central, we use the, uh, the UE side NAS component that well, basically performs most of, the, uh, most of the tasks here. And on the base station side, we have the S1 AP and GTPU interfaces. Uh, those connect to the MME and um, pass the messages uh, from, the NAS, uh, from the NAS module. Now in between there is a fake radio layer that saves us some of the issues of uh, actual wireless transmission and makes the system more reliable. Now um, while the NAS component is the main component, it is not sufficient only to use the, the NAS component. That is, for example, if you want to figure out if, uh, if the uh, smartphone has internet access in some state, you need to send, an, uh, for example, an uh, ICMP ping. And uh, for that, we integrate other layers. So, um, for example, if a connection is successfully established, then we get a message from the S1 AP layer. Uh, if a ICMP response arrives, then we get a notification from the GTPU layer. So we integrate all the other layers to, um, to augment the uh, feedback on the NAS layer. Okay, so the nice, one of the nice properties about uh, this system is that to the MME, to the core network, this appears as a base station with one connected phone. Um, the system basically behaves standard compliant in that way, so we can, uh, we can take any core network and connect the system to it and perform the testing right away. So the experiments that we conducted were on uh, two open source core networks and on two commercial core networks. Um, as a very general finding, we saw that the commercial core networks were actually prepared for unexpected messages, while the open source networks weren't. And um, the, the, core net, the open source core networks were actually a challenge in that way, because um, some of the, for example, if we found, found crashes, then those often were not uh, deterministic. For example, um, some memory, memory access might crash the network or might uh, just cause a hang or something like that. And it was very difficult to, um, to work around these, these issues, th those findings actually. Uh, now, what we did there is that uh, we chose to detect such uh, non-deterministic uh, errors and integrate it into the deterministic state machine in the sense um, that, we, um, that we add a sync state, a non-deterministic sync state. Um, so when the non-determinism is detected, then the testing stops and manual investigation, investigation has to start. In general, we found that in all the core networks, we were able to trigger bugs that could only be reached through a sequence of messages. So uh, that, is the, uh, that is the actual goal of the automata reconstruction. And um, yeah, in, in that sense, um, testing worked on all of the four networks. So how did we actually find out that there are bugs uh, in the state machine? because um, initially the state machine doesn't have any um, meaning attached. So it only has the, um, the transitions with an input and an output uh, message. But um, remember that we said we don't want to look at the standard message by message and then decide if, it, if this is a legal transition or not. Um, but we want to have a higher abstraction there. So what we did is uh, we initially tag all the states as unauthenticated. 
and uh, and then only the states that um, follow the uh, successful authentication with a successful activation of security are tagged as authenticated. Of course, we also have different. We we also have more properties, like for example, a successful a working internet connection. And uh, what we can perform after this step is uh, very easy, very simple model checking. So, for example, a transition from unauthenticated to authenticated is allowed if it is only going through the um, the successful authentication step. Um, of course, deauthenticating from authenticated to unauthenticated is also allowed. But what would not be allowed is a transition that directly goes from unauthenticated to the, un uh, to the internet state without passing um, the authentication. So in this case, that would yield the subgraph and then we could analyze what is actually happening there. So to sum it up, we perform automated testing in LTE networks. We use automata reconstruction for the generation of uh, test cases and also for a generation for, for an abstraction of the results. That allows us to focus on very high level properties without looking at the standard too much. Um, we find logical bugs in, uh, in core networks that are triggered by a sequence of messages and that couldn't be reached by uh, single, single messages alone. Thanks a lot for this final presentation. It looks like we have quite some time left for the Q&A. So we will begin with the first presentation. So Norbert, if you are there, it would be great. Yeah, I can see you. Turn on your camera and microphone. There you are. Um, let me quickly check if there is something on Slack. We can, I can begin with a question. Um, so this was about jamming, right? Jamming the infrastructure. So uh, in, with a very specific um, feature of 5G, the polar encoding. Um, I was just wondering, we saw so many different 5G presentations today. It's a very specific question. Well, what kind of setup did you use for the over-the-air implementation? Um, so first of all, to clarify, uh, the main idea was to overshadow the legitimate uh, MIB of the uh, uh, G not B transmission. That could lead to jamming, but it could lead uh, to other uh, sort of attacks depending on the on the fields on the MIB that are targeted. Um, uh, and yeah, the, the attack is possible uh, because of the very low rate uh, coding and um, the predictability of the SSB both in time and in content. Um, for the um, for the setup, uh, we use the open interface, uh, which is an open source uh, implementation for the G not B, which was uh, transmitting the the, the SSB um, with the twenty millisecond periodicity. Um, but then, due to the the not complete maturity of all these open source implementations, we we um, recorded the 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 spectrum, the IQ samples and we perform the attack offline. Okay, thank you. Um, I see one question on Slack. So Simon is asking, uh, first of all, he's thanking for the nice talk. Will the power efficiency be preserved even if the attacker G not B and UE are not co-located? For example, uh, the phase offset between UE and attacker is not predictable. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very good question, thank you. Um, so the um, you are right. The the attack will be less efficient in terms of power um, because the more well, basically the attacks. The, the more knowledge you have beforehand, the more efficient you could be. Um, if, for instance, the 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 UE is moving and the phase is changing abruptly, you will need to transmit with more power um, to compensate this because the number of phases that will be able to work will, will increment. Um, and this way, uh, you will still be able to perform the attack. OK, thank you. And what would be your uh, recommendation for the future? I mean, there is, there is this vulnerability in 5G, and 5G is in the middle of being rolled out, so it's far from being 
uh, an old mobile generation, what would be your recommendation to fix this? That's, so I think uh, uh, if you check the, the literature, one common issue for um, many of the attacks uh, showed on the synchronization signals and initial access is that nothing, uh, none of the initial um, uh, messages with in exchange between the UE and the GNOB are protected. There is no integrity protection, um, not any sort of uh, uh, encryption used over there. Um, as in, in previous talks, they highlighted the use of uh, SUSI. Um, that is uh, the first time it, uh, some sort of public key uh, system is used in, in cellular networks. And that's a very important feature that could be also used for other um, other purposes like uh, integrity protection of these key essential messages that are transmitted in the in the initial access. And we also mentioned this in the paper as one of the uh, possible uh, countermeasures or requirements uh, to have a, an efficient and effective countermeasure for this attack and any other um, attack that focuses on this initial synchronization. Okay, and as an alternative, would it be possible to um maybe not only recognize that an attack is going on, but also find out where the adversary is. I mean, mm -hmm. that person has to stand somewhere and have a device. So would it be possible yeah. to localize that? Um, I think for, so for instance, uh, for other um, attacks that look for overshadowing, um, perhaps it's easier to find what sequence was being transmitted if you are transmitting a whole sequence in our sense it's only a, in our uh, work is only a subset of sub carriers which are uh, probably um, harder to predict and probably harder to locate the user but uh, it all depends on the capabilities of the defender right like uh, if you really want to protect your system and you have the resources and the money uh, uh, you could just uh, scan for power perhaps and 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 try to try to uh, localize uh, not legitimate users in the area or, or transmissions in that in that certain band. Uh, so I think there is a there is a possibility it all depends on the resources of the defender, I guess. Yeah. Okay, and just out of curiosity, now that we're talking about resources, how much <laughs> how much would it cost to conduct the attack? And on the opposite, do you have an idea how, how expensive it would be to de detect the attack or localize the adversary? Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I know much about the, the costs of, of defenses, but uh, normally mo most of these attacks, uh, for instance, in our case, uh, you're using a, a software-defined radio. Um, uh, so they are not very expensive. Uh, they are getting more and more accessible. Even smartphones nowadays, are, are you're able to modify them to work as, a, as an RF front end and transmit uh, the information you want. Um, the the thing is, um, those will come with some limitations, but it's also true that uh, the initial synchronization uh, is is um, it's supposed to be a, a, an easy way of synchronization. So it doesn't even occupy much uh, bandwidth. Um, you don't need very high high requirements because, um, in fact, it's something that you're supposed to to be able to do even with uh, IoT devices and, and those things. Okay, so we have quite a problem there. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, do we have okay. any more questions about the first talk? I'm just checking Slack. I don't see anything there. Well, then, thanks a lot for your presentation and for your yeah. answers in the Q&A. Thank then, you for your questions. I think we'll go over to the second talk. Um, mm -hmm. Alexia, I already see you. Yes, hello. Hello. Okay, let's check Slack. What do we have? Okay, there's one. Merlin is asking, from your perspective, how should standards look like to help formal analysis? Yeah, thank you. That's a very good question. Uh, so I would say in general, it depends very much on the standard. So for some smaller standards, of course, uh, if you can summarize everything nicely in one document, it helps a lot in just understanding the, the protocol and the standards as a whole, but then in cases like 5G, it's, it's of course understandable that it is quite scattered. And uh, for example, in the handovers, it's not just one protocol we run, uh, but it's it's part of this big ecosystem of, of different networks. 
Um, one cool thing that is included in the 5G standard is for the inter 5G handovers. There are these abstracted versions uh, where they have summarized the protocols from a security point of view. So they show messages that are related to key derivation, which uh, was very helpful for us when we were formalizing and modeling the protocols. Okay, and a follow-up question of Merlin is, um, could your analysis be included in future standards, maybe in a way that is both readable for developers and for formal analysis? Yeah, possibly. I mean, I, I do believe that uh, publishing as many uh, formal modeling attempts and uh, works is important. And um, yeah, I, I hope it will be helpful for future standardization as well. Um, so in this regard, another question would be, what happens if there is a new release? Do you have to start over again? And like, is it a lot of manual work to first inspect the specification and then derive the model from that? Or is that something that can be automated somehow? Uh, yeah, another good question. Uh, I would say that creating the first version of the model is the most time consuming because it won't involves reading a lot of the standards, understanding uh, the protocols and writing and optimizing the models. Uh, for this project, it was rather long. We worked on it for more than a year. So we were tracking release 16 specifically of uh, 5G, which meant uh, every now and then checking the new versions of the protocols uh, and the standards to make sure that nothing significant has changed. Um, but mainly the changes are small enough that uh, then afterwards it's not too much work to make small changes in a model unless they completely scrap the protocol and decide to start from zero. Okay, thank you. Um, here's another question from Norbert. Um, thanks for the nice talk. Um, I was wondering in your slides, you mentioned how you analyze intra 5G and inter 5G handover to mm -hmm. 4G. Is the handover to other networks such as Wi-Fi described in the standard? And if it is, would it be possible to include it in the formal verification? Yes, uh, that's something we didn't look at in this project, uh, mainly because we wanted to analyze the cellular handovers. Um, I would assume it would be quite different from, from the from these handovers. So it would be a separate project entirely. And probably a separate set of specification pages to yeah, read. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so I have a rather specific question. Uh, what happens in the case of roaming? So I'm, I'm roaming home. Does this change anything? I am not entirely sure about that. I would guess that you would have to do some something more than a simple handover. So the idea in a handover would be that we can uh, quickly transfer a data connection. So let's say you're sitting on a train and you keep jumping from station to station. So instead of having to always derive a new set of keys with each uh, uh, base station, you can just re-derive the session key and continue your session. But I, I would guess that in a wrong scenario, that would be quite different. Okay. Um, could this be like your, your focus was on handover um, for mm -hmm. obvious reasons? Um, could this be transferred to different security relevant features of the 5G specification or would this be like a, a whole new work and not comparable? I, I would say it depends on which part so this work is sort of continuation on a previous analysis of 5G AKA. So in 5G AKA, you would then derive the initial set of keys and in handovers, you would use those keys to re-derive new keys. So here our assumption was that AKA has been run uh, successfully and that's the starting point. So if there is something that's closely related to this set of session keys, then I'm sure it could be uh, similarly tied to our our models. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, I, I think I skipped one question. Kevin is asking, uh, thanks for the interesting formal analysis. Um, 
Was there anything that you found particularly unusual during the analysis? Yes, thank you for the question. So in addition to, as I previously mentioned, just the size of 5G, uh, from a modeling point of view, an uh, interesting challenge we had was we decided to not limit the number of consecutive or parallel handovers. So again, with this train scenario, when you have a group of people all talking on their phones, sitting on a train to keep jumping from station to station, we wanted to make sure that there was no flaw in the protocol that would allow misbinding between these different users and also that an attacker couldn't use an ongoing session somewhere else to uh, create an attack on, on, a, on a user. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> and then there is a, a, a comment from Merlin. Um, he says that the theoretical attack description for sushi linking that he mentioned was also found with formal analysis by your team, <laughs> like the team around uh, the yeah. second presentation. All right. Okay, are there any more questions on the second presentation? I see someone typing. <laughs> I'm not sure if there's a question behind that. No, it's about paper three. Okay, then thanks a lot for your presentation and for answering the questions. And then we'll Thank go you. on with the third presentation. So. Hi. Hi, Merlin. <laughs> okay, Hi. so we have quite some questions on your first talk. Um, so we have three questions from Clavel. I hope that's the right pronunciation. Um, what is the impact of sequence number on authentication challenges or SQN? I'm not sure that sequence number on authentic authentication challenges. During the attack phase, the reset and sync phase is added before the sushi probe phase. Could we switch the sequence? Um. Yeah, maybe uh, to answer the um, the whole package around the um, this reset and sequence uh, uh, reset and uh, synchronization phase. This is usually um, to keep the UE the smartphone um, retrying because if you have too many unsuccessful authentication steps, then the smartphone will notice that. Um, yeah, this uh, this doesn't lead to uh, to a successful connection, so it will just stop. But um, we found that um, two tries are actually okay. So what we do is we always alternate between a successful authentication um, from that is coming from the network and then one probe that is uh, used for the sushi catcher. And um, yeah, so. That, um, that answers some of the questions that uh, Clavel has, um, because he was asking if it was also possible to replay some of the um, authentications. And well, you can replay the, um, the authentication the, that is for the probing step, but uh, you always need to have a fresh authentication to make sure that smartphone um, yeah, will we'll keep retrying. Okay, thank you. Then second question. In the article, you mentioned a result tab of your experience. How did you test an invalid authentication mm. with commercial network? Did you repeat these uh, registra registration in loop with the SRSUE? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, so we did a couple of experiments because we wanted to uh, test all the components involved, but of course we couldn't test them all in one experiment. So what we did is um, for for testing the modem, we were uh, we were using the five G network, and um, then to estimate if um, if the networks or the SIM cards have um, rate limiting, we were testing those separately. So what we did. Uh, is just like uh, Clavel says, we uh, were, we were using SRSUE to collect um, 
to collect authentication um, challenges from the network. That way we could see how, how fast the network supplies us with these challenges. And then later on, we were using those still valid uh, authentication to, to, um, to test the SIM card for speed. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And then the third question of this batch is, during your experimentation, you mentioned no modifiable 5G standalone UE. Uh, is it not possible to experiment with uh, the Amaris of UE? And did you make a lot of adaptions using, using the NGAP interface? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, so, so usually if you, have the, if you have a fake base station, then um, well, you have a radio network from the from the real operator and then you have a separate radio network that is the uh the imc catcher um we didn't um we did we didn't have the equipment uh to um to build a completely radio attacker because that would require that we have both a um g node b and a ue that is relaying everything to the real network so what we did instead is that we have the the real network only as the the core network itself and the uh the machine in the middle attacker is only sitting on the ngap interface um uh, but um since i mean NGAP here is just the uh, the transport layer, so we didn't have to um, to manipulate that layer at all. Um, we we were just uh, programming the uh, the free five GC uh, software in that way to um, yeah to manipulate the NAS messages um, in on on that link. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the details. I oh, hope that I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Okay, so Marco is saying really nice work, first of all, and then the question is, how many changes of sushi is the catcher able to link over time? Is there a limitation to this? Um, I mean, I don't think there is a limitation just by the standard. Um, we were just trying until it was taking too long and we didn't want to you know we were just stopping at some time like we didn't try for um for more than a couple of hours but um i don't think just from the standard that there is a, le a limit of course the network can um i don't know maybe assign something like a back off timer for authentication steps so that could uh inhibit uh, inhibit retrying all the time um yeah but but just from the standard as is, I, I don't think there is a limit. Okay, thank you. And then Norbert is asking, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but is this a tech possible because of the UE answering with the reason of failure in the authentication mm -hmm. response? For example, sync Mac. If so, would it be possible to protect this authentication response, perhaps using the already in place public key infrastructure? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, he's uh, he's right. So um, this is this is because of the um, well, we are using the um, the UA as an oracle, uh, and depending on the um, response that is coming from the authentication, uh, we know uh, we know the identity, and there are also different flavors than the one that we were using. So um, in the formal anal uh, analysis that I mentioned. Um, they also mention um, just using the sequence number, um, but um, yeah, to be honest, we we didn't we didn't try that. Um, so we were focusing on having a reliable attack that is repeatable. Um, as for the um, for the protection, I think there are a couple of um, possibilities to to include um, protection because you can have a um, for example, the sushi scheme that can be defined by the network operator. So you can have a custom scheme that has something like a freshness built in. Uh, I think that that would be uh, one of the um, countermeasures that is leveraging the public key infrastructure. Okay, thank you. And now Simon is asking, uh, saying thanks for the cool work and great talk and then mm -hmm. Do you see a persistent denial of service possibility due to the UE and AMF 
getting out of sync due to the continued regist registration requests at the AMF. Mm -hmm. um, not sure, actually. I mean, we we can have a we can have a denial of service for the for the UE simply because the UE stays in our cell and that worked quite well. Um, I'm not sure about the AMF. We weren't trying to, um, I don't know, DOS the, uh, the AMF. Um, so I don't know. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a final question on this topic. Um, so in the, in the presentation, we saw an example with the IMSI. Um, hmm. What changes if, if we use the NAI? instead of the image so like first name last name at whatever dot whatever mm. um i'm not sure if there's changes anything particular um, the way i understand so so we didn't try that but the way i understand um they those are interchangeable so you still get the authentication uh, request back that is assigned with the identity that you were asking for so um yeah i don't think anything changes in particular uh, especially the uh, nia is translated into a sushi just the same way um yeah there was actually a great paper now uh, called nori uh, that is uh, uh, that is uh, analyzing uh, the nia in this regard so i can recommend reading that yeah, that's why I'm asking. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, all right, then, then let's just switch over to your second paper. Um, uh, you're being grilled here. Okay, um, Peter is asking, uh, saying, nice work. Uh, can you give a concrete mm -hmm. example of a sequence of messages that results in problematic behavior in the MME? Mm. Um, so just uh, off the top of my head, I can't I can't give a good example. But um, for for example, we saw that um, for the open source um, for the open source implementations, some were checking message integrity only during the security mode command. But after that, they just didn't check it anymore. So um, I mean, manually, we wouldn't have thought of checking that. We would just do the same, like check check if the authentication uh, if the message authentication code is required to during, during the um, security mode um, procedure but with this automated testing we found it that afterwards we don't need the Mac at all um, and besides what we what we saw for example is that um, the mess the network, um, would always send integrity protected messages like it should, but after doing a sequence of um, basically detaching service uh, request, detaching service request, uh, going idle service request, going idle service request, then suddenly the network would, uh, would send un an unprotected message. Now that wasn't exploitable, but that was kind of a, a good example for us where we could see that we can actually confuse the network with with sequences of messages. Okay, thank you. And then there is another question from Kevin um, saying, very nice work. Does a different state machine need to be Thanks. generated for each hmm? For each protocol, uh, for no, example, I just said, I just said, said thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, does a different state machine need to be generated for each protocol? For example, S1A, S6, S11, and were there commonalities between them? Mm. I think so. What we are having a look at is actually the combination of a, of many state machines because the MME, well, the MME is kind of the central node there, but there are a lot of procedures that actually ask other nodes over other protocols. So actually, there are many um, state machines, and um, well, we we can't from the perspective of the UE, we can't tell them apart. Um, and we weren't really focusing on that. So we were just trying to see if we can um, uh, derive derive um, a state machine um, from the UE perspective, because that is accessible to attackers. Um, now, that state machine for sure is only uh, 
kind of a small part of the overall state machine. So if I guess if you have access uh, to those interfaces, then you can perform something similar specific for those uh, other sub-state machines. But um, yeah, that wasn't the target for us. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, we already reached the end of the session. So thanks again for all the nice presentations and, and the really cool Q&A. And if I'm looking at the program, we will now have a 15 minutes break. And after that, there will be the awards session. So stay tuned for the awards. Thanks again and goodbye.
Welcome to the fun part, which is the award session before we go directly into our third keynote. It is our great pleasure to walk you through both our distinguished paper awards as well as the demo and poster, the best demo and uh, poster awards. Now, first, it is my pleasure to introduce the process that we use to arrive at the distinguished paper award. Next slide, please. Big thanks go to the Distinguished Paper Award Committee, which is a subset of our technical program committee. And we try to strive for balance here in this small subset of committee members as well. So our thanks for the effort in going through all the papers again, all the reviews and comments on the papers again, as well as the presentations. Our thanks go to Will Enk, Matthias Hollig, Naofumi Homa, and Katarina Kors for acting on this committee. The process was fairly straightforward. We assigned a number of points to each of those committee members and the committee members were free to spread those points for their favorite distinguished papers among, um, as, uh, among different multiple papers. Also, we had a limit of a maximum number of papers that uh, those points could be spread over. And then among the committee, the Papers with the highest numbers of those accumulated points were taken into very close consideration and the committee arrived at an un anonymous, um, <clears throat> sorry, at a clear vote for the distinguished best paper. Now um, to hand over to Leila for actually announcing the winner. Thanks, next slide please. So our committee came up with the two finalists, as you can read on this slide. So the Weizsäck 2021 Distinguished Paper Award finalists are, sorry, <laughs> sorry, previous slide, <laughs> Amazon Echo Dot or the Reverberating Secrets of IoT Devices by Dennis Giese and Guara Nubir and security analysis of IEEE 802.15.4z HRP UWB time of flight distance measurement by Mridula Singh, Mark Roslin, Ezad Zalzala, Patrick Leu, and Serjan Chapkun. The first paper was uh, uh, co-authored by both uh, authors from North Northeastern University in the US, and the second one is uh, fully co-authored by ETH uh, co-authors. So if you, if you learn from here, you should not collaborate out your own institution if you want awards. So this seems to be the, 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 the important thing. Next slide, please. So, uh, and the winner is, next slide. <laughs> The second one that was on the slide, so the ETH uh, collaboration on security analysis of IEEE UWB time of flight distance measurement uh, by Mridula, uh, Mark, Ezat, Patrick, and Sergeant. So many congratulations. So the committee uh, explained that the the second paper was a clear runner up. So we we found it's 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 actually important to mention both. And please allow me then to read exactly the statement of our award committee about the winning paper. So they state, the award committee particularly emphasized on the novelty of the analyzed technology in combination with its relevance in upcoming applications. The authors analyzed the security of distance measurement as specified for the UWP HRP mode of the novel IEEE standard. The specification is very new, and as of now, there are only a few early adopter chips built into Apple and Samsung devices, as well as cars. UWB HRP has been marketed for featuring secure ranging. However, this paper shows that the physical layer properties of UWB HRP measurements allow distance shortening attacks. So it's, it's very novel and a great technical contribution, and also a word for our um, runner-ups that's uh, both, pa both papers were actually presented yesterday, uh, one in the session on side channels and one on, on physical um, properties. So the uh, Amazon Echo paper, um, the statement is the, the, the paper studies the significant and timely problems of, of smart speakers. 
It includes an extensive investigation of how the popular Amazon Echo Dot operates under the hood and highlights the security and privacy implications when users resell or dispose of their devices. Congratulations to the runner-ups again. Uh, do we have uh, co-authors in the audience? I think I saw Mridula from the winning part team. I'm here. Thank you so much. <laughs> So maybe just just a quick word from you. Uh, was it like a little like a recent work, and uh, uh, how how did you kind of get motivated to look in, in, into this protocol, and uh, what was behind the the scene, say? So I was actually already working on other aspects of ultra wideband ranging, and uh, then we looked at this standard, and we said that okay, this uh, this standard proposed like something new. And let's see how good the security of this new proposal is. And given that a lot of uh, companies are now interested in building this hardware, and uh, as soon as this uh, hardware was like finalized, there were already like hardware based on this hardware, like already in the market. So it was like uh, kind of very motivating to analyze it. Okay, great. Thanks, Mridula, and many congratulations again. Thank you so much. We will be sending the ACM plaque uh, for the best paper award uh, your way. And uh, with this, uh, I hand over to the poster committee chair, Eric. Yes, um, I'm pleased to welcome you to the best demo and the best uh, poster awards. And um, yeah, so as you may know, uh, we didn't conduct it with a committee, but instead we gave you, the audience, uh, the power to vote for the best paper and for the best poster award. So we had a poll on Slack and actually a lot of people participated. Also, it was a very busy poster and demo session. And even after the official end of the session, a lot of people stayed to discuss things with the authors and the people uh, who were there. And there were quite a few active discussions there. And um, it looked to me the demos were a bit more popular than the posters. And also on the poll on Slack, we had a very close race between a lot of different candidates. However, uh, we have a clear winner. So there was one paper, well, one demo that actually had the most votes, which was <clears throat> which was Open Haystack. The best demo award of this year goes to Open Haystack, a framework for tracking personal Bluetooth devices via Apple's massive Find My Network. This was joint work by Alexander Heinrich, Milian Stuter, and Matthias Hollig from TU Darmstadt. And I think Milan should also be here. So could you please uh, enable your video and um, yeah, and uh, say something here. Are you in the call? Uh, yes, I'm in the call. Thank you. Thank you a lot. I, I cannot enable my video right now. Um, but yeah, th thanks a lot for, for this award. Um, actually, Alex should also be here. Uh, and he was sort of the driving force behind this. So um, <laughs> I, I also thank uh, you in in his uh, uh, in his stead, basically. Ah, oh, there he is. Great. And I was also present uh, during the session, and I saw a lot of people that were at your demo ask a lot of questions. So did you also learn something about um, about your project? So did you learn something about potential improvements and potential ways to conduct further research. Well, I also want to say thank you. And uh, a lot of people were actually asking like the question, if Apple is, can do something against our open approach to find the Find My Network. And uh, yes, they can try to um, at least make it more difficult for us, but we have already solutions up to keep Open Haystack um, available and running for the next years, hopefully. Congratulations. So for those of you who don't know, Open Haystack is basically um, a kind of um, 
open source, well, framework to use Apple Find My Network. So um, you can create your own air tags and you can also track them without having to rely, at least without having to rely fully on Apple software. I think you still need uh, a Mac, right? Yeah, at the moment you still need a Mac, Mac but we plan to have it available um, without a Mac, but that's uh, future work. Excellent. So thank you. And maybe we will hear something about your future work in next year's edition of WISEC. Now, I would like to come to the best poster award. Uh, we also had a lot of posters in the session. And actually for the posters, we had a very clear winner. So the winning submission received way more votes than all the other submissions. And um, to make it short, The winner of the uh, best poster award is the cross protocol attacks, weaponizing a smartphone by diverting its Bluetooth controller. This is joint work by Romain Carrier, Florent Gontier, uh, Guillaume Auriol, uh, Vincent uh, Nicomet, uh, Mohamed Kai Sin, and Geraldine uh, Machanto. So, and I'm actually pretty sure I mispronounced all of your names. Um, I'm sorry for that. But uh, Romain should actually also be here present in the call. Romain, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm there. Thank Great. So how did you experience the poster and demo session? Uh, it was a, a very fun moment and uh, it was very pleasant to talk uh, with the visitors. Great. Uh, which question did you get most often? Um, I have uh, a lot of questions about uh, how uh, we can uh, use a Bluetooth controller to uh, interact with other protocols, such as uh, Zigbee, for example. And uh, I tried to describe uh, the, the process. So, uh, so is it possible? Uh, yes. So in this paper, we explored the feasibility of implementing cross-technology pivoting attacks on a Samsung Galaxy S20 smartphone. And uh, it's possible to exploit the similarities between uh, the modulations of Bluetooth and Zigbee, for example, uh, to uh, force a Bluetooth controller to communicate with uh, this kind of protocols. Great, that sounds like um, a very exciting starting point for new potential research. So maybe in the next year's edition of YSEC, we can find some papers that describe how to take all kinds of different radio protocols that are compatible with off-the-shelf Bluetooth controllers. Um, yeah, I would like to thank all participants of the poster and demo session for their votes, for their particip participation, and also for their great ideas how to even bring the entire thing further. And now I would like to hand the word back to our hosts uh, and the next uh, keynote. Hello, everyone. Um, congratulations also from my side to all of our award winners. It is now my my pleasure to introduce our next keynote speaker. It is my honor to introduce Dr. Malik Tatipamula, who is joining us from Silicon Valley in San Jose in the US now. Thank you for joining us today. The CV of our keynote speaker is impressive, so please bear with me while I go, I go through some important um, parts of that. Dr. Malik Tatipamula is the CTO of Ericsson Silicon Valley, where he leads the evolution of Ericsson's technology and champions the company's next phase of innovation and growth. This was a sentence I had to read. Um, prior to Ericsson, he um, was working in several leadership positions, um, in particular at F5, um, F5 Networks, at Juniper Networks, at Cisco, at Motorola, Nortel, and at the Indian Institute of Technology in Chennai. He has more than 30 years of experience in, um, in unique leadership roles in the industry, 
um, leading innovations, standard contributions, product, uh, products and solutions, designing implementations of early real world deployments um, within the telecom um, sector, and also um, like general innovations for the future. He's been also working with academia to accelerate the architectural transitions in the telecom industry. Um, he implemented programs that brought um, world-leading innovations to the telecom, in, telecom sector, um, launching over 50 products and solutions that are deployed in global telecom networks and that enable these major network transitions starting from 2G to 5G and in the future then 6G. Um, Dr. Malik Tatipamula has a PhD in Information and Communications Engineering from the University of Tokyo in Japan and a Master's in Communication Systems from the Indian Institute of Technology in Chennai in India. Since 2011, he has been a visiting professor at King's College in London, where the world's first 5G network was demonstrated together with Ericsson and Vodafone. He is a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Engineering and of the Institution of Engineering and Technology in the UK. He received numerous awards, more than I can uh, list and mention here. I, let me just point out um, three of them here. The IEEE Communications Society, so COMSOC Distinguished Industry Leader Award, the CTO of the Year 2021 Award from Silicon Valley Business Journal, as well as the IET Achievement Medal in Telecommunications. He delivered lectures and taught courses at UC Berkeley, University of Tokyo, Stanford, and other universities, mentored over 100 undergrad and graduate students, delivered 400 plus keynotes and invited talks, tutorials, and lectures, co-authored two books, um, author, authored 100, more than 100 publications and panels, and served on more than 40 IEEE conference committees. There would be much more to say, but I feel I should stop here now and uh, hand over to, um, to my, um, uh, our keynote speaker. He will talk about securing next G wireless networks on the technological and architectural trends um, with causing fundamental shifts in the way that security is, is designed in 5G and future 6G networks. Before we start, let me remind uh, our attendees to ask questions on Slack in the keynote and awards channel, as well on possibly, um, possibly on the YouTube channel, if you like. With that, I hand over. We start a little bit later than we planned, but we have a longer break planned afterwards, so feel free to use um, the time as was scheduled. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Christina. It's my great pleasure to be up. Thanks, uh, thank you and the entire organizing team for this excellent workshop. Uh, and I would like to also thank all the participants and the award winners for the paper and poster session. Fantastic job there. So what I would like to do, I would like to talk about how we see security evolving in the future wireless networks, including 5G and beyond. So my goal is to really talk from architectural perspective, how the 5G, 6G architectures are evolving and what sort of security threat vectors we see and uh, what are the challenges and opportunities for research communities such as yourself to really focus on addressing some of these challenges uh, um, in uh, wireless security for that matter. So that's the essence of my presentation. And uh, so just a quick uh, a recap of my agenda is to give a quick introduction about what is 5G, why is it different from 4G and uh, how that 5G architecture is moving towards more distributed cloud, I mean the sense how the mobile networks and cloud, how they are getting integrated, how they are coming together uh, to address some of the uh, emerging industry 4.0 applications. And uh, how do we implement security in such a integrated architecture where the mobile and cloud are coming together? And what sort of research challenges we see <laughs> for you to help us look at? So that's the essence of my presentation. And uh, let's look at how things evolve. Let me just uh, close my screen here. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Now you can see the past, present, and future, right? Uh, just to uh, review the uh, past four generation technologies. So the first generation in early 1980s, it was mainly analog communications. And uh, in 1980s, hardly 5 million mobile subscribers around the world, 5 million, hardly 5 million. And uh, mostly the phones were owned by business people. But as we move towards 2G, we move from analog to digital communications in 1990s and mainly for voice SMS. And that to maximum uh, uh, eight kilobits per second kind of speeds. But one of the biggest transitions happened from 2G to 3G. So 2G was circuit switch, more TDMS switching. Now move to 3G where we started integrating internet protocol. Then we started seeing mobile internet. You know, but it gave birth to mobile internet. But still the speeds were only 155 kilobits per second. But the major leap happened when we moved from 3G to 4G, where we implemented all IP transition, IP being internet protocol, that's when the smartphones came in and the 4G provided 15 megabits per second. So you can see how things evolve from single digit kilobits per second speeds to 15 megabits per second speeds in the 4G world. The moment we had 4G with all IP networking, which is internet protocol across, you know, end to end. And then providing the 50 megabits, 15 megabits per second speeds opened up app economy. We call it as app economy. Means you can see all sorts of applications on your smartphones, both consumer and business and entertainment applications. So that really transformed how we live, you know, day by day. So you can see the things evolve over time, but also this brought in interesting security challenges. When we moved to 4G, so we have seen several security challenges due to the fact that it's all IP. And also we have seen number of applications on top of the smartphones. So anytime we see benefits, it also creates certain challenges. So this is what we call it as mobile broadband. 4G is essentially mobile broadband where we are able to provide broadband speeds on mobile phones, which is 15 megabits per second. That way we are enable, enabling streaming applications so that you can watch uh, 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 your soccer game or basketball game on your cell phones, given that you have broadband speeds on mobile phones. Now, what is 5G? 5G is taking one step further. In terms of the speeds, we are talking about 20 gigabits per second, downlink speeds, 10, gigabit, 10 gigabits per second, uplink speeds. When it comes to latency, we are talking about one millisecond latency. And uh, when it comes to the positioning accuracy, it's about three feet positioning accuracy. And uh, especially in the case of device connection density, within a mile distance, you can have 2.5 million devices that can be connected to 5G. So these are the performance boosts in 5G compared to 4G. So for simply speaking, in the 4G world, we realize megabits per second speeds, but in 5G world, we are moving towards gigabits per second. That opens up new applications. Those new applications being, you know, extending the mobile broadband to be extreme mobile broadband, enabling new applications such as virtual reality and augmented reality on your smartphones, because 
a, a, when you look at virtual reality and augmented reality, when you look at 8K streaming kind of capabilities, you're talking about the bandwidth need of 200 to 300 megabits per second. So that's when 4G starts choking. Hence, you need to move to 5G. So your first type of applications is taking 4G mobile broadband to extreme, providing human-to-human -human applications such as AR, VR, mixed reality, human-to-mission applications, or mission-to-mission -mission applications. The second type of use cases that 5G enables is the massive scale communications. In other words, you have smart watches, you, you have all sorts of smart devices, including Nest in your home for temperature monitoring. So the moment you start connecting these devices to 5G network, you can think about massive scale communication, including the smart homes, smart cities, smart vehicles, and so on. The last but not least one is ultra reliable, low latency applications. So that is public safety or vehicle to vehicle or vehicle to vehicle networking, remote surgery. Some of these things where every millisecond matters, the precision, accuracy, all of them are extremely important in terms of reliability and latency. So the 5G all of a sudden taking 4G from consumer broadband all the way into industrial applications. So this is where the 5G is. 5G is about taking the bandwidth towards gigabits per second, bringing the latency to one millisecond. That opens up the plethora of new applications. That brings the industry convergence, bringing the telecom players, media entertainment, cloud players and industrial IoT players all together on top of 5G as an open innovation platform. But it also brings up very interesting problems. When you look at 5G network, just simply speaking, uh, um, although this is a very complex diagram, but let's talk about 5G network architecture. On the left side, you see all sorts of devices, including the smartphones, and vehicles, and so on. They're all connected to 5G network, so-called radio access networks. You know, when you see these antennas, base stations, they're all 5G edge locations. And then those edge locations are connected to the core and to the data centers. So 5G, first thing is that 5G is introducing new use cases, as I mentioned, in the Slivoti use cases. 5G is also bringing in new frequencies, means, we are now moving towards a millimeter wave, uh, gigahertz kind of frequency bands. And it also brings a new radio technologies. And we are also disaggregating the network. We are you know, splitting the control and user plane. We are bringing the edge compute closer to the devices to process applications. And we are slicing the network we are basically taking one physical network and slicing it across as multiple virtual networks. And then we are bringing the cloud native principles to drive microservices uh, architecture with 5G networks. And in order to really automate the network, we are bringing the AI automation. So these are the new things that we are implementing in 5G compared to 4G. The second thing is that 5G distributed multi-cloud infrastructure. For the last 10 years, you must have noticed the world moved from the applications or the workloads, you can call it as, or applications or data. It moved from on-premise to the data centers or central cloud. So that's how Amazon Web Services, Azure, Google Cloud, came to existence where all the applications and workloads moved from on-premise to the cloud. And that gave the birth of these cloud providers. But the next 10 years is going to be completely reversed. The applications are now coming back to the, uh, uh, coming back to the locations that are closer to the 
devices or endpoints because the compute is now much cheaper. Compute perm factors are very small. And also the ultra low latency workloads are driving much closer processing of the workloads rather than sending the workloads all the way to the central data center. So that's first trend that is driving the 5G and edge compute integration is the distributed cloud. The second thing is in the 2G, 3G world, it's all about physical. We used to have physical hardware, chassis or appliances, monolithic applications. But in the 4G world, the world moved towards virtualization, more with VMs, virtual machines, as a unit of scaling, and then developing applications on top of that. In the 5G, the world is moving towards much further where we are able to virtualize even operating system at a kernel level so that we can implement microservices architecture in a cloud native environment. And uh, the lifespan of applications are very small in the sense we can rapidly develop applications in minutes and days as opposed to years in 2G and 3G work. So these are the trends that are fundamentally impact the way we implement security. Earlier, we used to secure, we used to have big firewalls and DDoS, uh, uh, web application firewalls and so on. They used to sit in front of the servers to secure the servers in the physical world. In the virtual world, we used to have the same firewalls and DDoS and other components, but they were in a virtual format to secure the virtual missions. In the containers, it's a different story altogether. So that's what I'm going to focus on, how security is changing as we move towards 5G and beyond while the architectures are evolving. The second thing I would like to highlight is, simply speaking, let me explain this uh, uh, diagram here, edge compute locations. On the left side, you see devices that are connected to some sort of edge, edge being your CPE device, the smartphones connected to the edge locations, and the edge locations are connected to the base stations. So for example, in your home, your cell phone may be connected to Wi-Fi access point, and that gets connected to your uh, 5G radio antennas. And then they are connected to central offices and to the data center. And the data centers are connected to hyper cloud providers or uh, uh, large clouds. Now, what is happening is that when you have a packet or some sort of data from your smartphones or your endpoints or IoT devices, that data has to go all the way to the hyperscale private data centers to be processed. The, it takes about almost one second for it to go through all the middle uh, uh, segments uh, to be processed in the hyper cloud private data centers. So one second is a too long for many applications. So the idea is that how do we take that hyper cloud uh, uh, you know, resources and how do we distribute them across multiple edge locations? Means how do we take the compute and integrate that compute at customer enterprise edge or remote network edge? And how do we process this data coming from IoT devices? right at the edge locations and make inference out of it. So the second aspect of uh, uh, impact on security is edge compute integration. So the first one, as I mentioned, is applications evolving, applications moving from central cloud to the edge locations and compute is being transitioned because applications are moving to edge locations, hence you need the edge compute there. Since edge compute is coming, the infrastructure is evolving towards containers and microservices. 
then having just connectivity, having compute to process the workloads, and then you need intelligence to make inference out of the uh, processed data. That's where the distributed AI comes. So distributed AI is about how can I uh, make inference out of the data that's being processed so that I can make actionable insights to the end devices or IoT devices. So when we look at uh, the a distributed AI is that you have multiple use cases on the right side, like image search recommendations like Yelp or Google search, or the second type of use case could be self-driving cars, surveillance systems. Third type of use case is smart cities. The fourth one is industrial IoT like smart factories. Then on the left side, you have multiple deployment scenarios, cloud to cloud, cloud to edge, edge to cloud and edge to edge. Now, if you really see the characteristics of the use cases, when you do any type of Google search or uh, recommend, uh, uh, rec and even use Yelp systems for recommendations, the data models are, the characteristics of the data models are such a way that they're not latency sensitive. They might be data uh, bandwidth hungry or bandwidth sensitive, but they're not latency sensitive. So hence you can process such kind of workloads and use cases in the central data center. So that's why I call it as cloud to cloud. But when you are looking at self-driving cars, where the car is traveling at 100 kilometers per hour, 100 kilometers per hour is equivalent to 30 meters in one second. So that means the car would have traveled 30 meters in one second. So 30 meters is a long distance in one second. So hence latency matters in situations like self-driving cars, surveillance systems. So that's when we need to process the data at the edge location so that we can cut down the uh, latency from one second to one millisecond. So that's when the use case such as self-driving cars are very much relevant to deployment use or scenarios such as cloud to edge, where we train the data in centralized locations, but we do the inferencing at the edge locations to address the latency. Then the third type of use case could be smart city use cases, where the deployment is edge to cloud, in this case, we not only train the data where the models can be centralized, but we can implement federated learning. It depends on where to do training, where to do the inferencing. So depending on multiple use cases in smart cities, it could be as simple as traffic control systems. It could be water management. It could be any other smart city applications. So where we need to think about federated type of learning. Then the third one, the last but not least one is edge to edge. In the case of industrial IoT like smart factory, where the predictive maintenance and repair is extremely important in the case of moving robots or, or even mining applications, we have to think about not only training but inferencing the data at the edge location. So that means not only we do learning, training, and inferencing all at one location, closer to the uh, end devices at the edges. So why am I talking about this? Because we need to think about how do we secure these data models? How do we secure these AI machine learning algorithms? When we have such kind of use cases that are deployed in different locations, we had to think about what sort of uh, um, training and inferencing methods are we applying for different use cases in different deployment uh, scenarios. In that case, what sort of security threats we expect and how do we do the secure training and inferencing of data models? 
Now you can ask me, how do we connect all these things? How do we connect these dots? As I mentioned earlier, applications are coming closer to the user instead of being processed. In order to uh, take care of the applications, compute is coming because you need to have compute to host the applications. Yeah. And just having compute alone is not good. You need to have some sort of intelligence to uh, get the actionable insights out of the process data on top of the compute. So hence, you need to think about distributed AI for such kind of use cases in deployment scenarios. Then putting all the pieces together, you know, I call it as convergence of four Cs. Four Cs being connectivity, compute, control, and content. Content means applications, you can call it as. Control is AI machine learning, it's control theory. And compute is, in this case, edge compute, and connectivity, in this case, 5G. So when you look at past, present, future, right? In 1980s, when we invented the 2G in the connectivity world, at the same time, in the compute world, mainframe was going. Research in mainframe was going. And in control theory at CMU, Corning Mellon, Professor Raj Reddy and his team, they were looking at more symbolic AI, rule-based AI. And the content was pretty much monolithic. That was 30 years ago. Now, when you do fast forward 2020, there is a huge amount of research going on across these four layers, but they are interdependent. So the key message in 1990 is that the research across these four areas, connectivity, compute, control, and content, they are independent. There's no dependency between connectivity level research to compute level research to control theory and content. But fast forward 2020, there is a strong dependency between the research between the 5G integration with the edge compute, integration with the distributed AI, and uh, microservices. So that's what I call it as convergence of four Cs, where this sort of convergence is driven by ultra reliable low latency applications. And uh, you know very well, if you want to realize ultra reliable low latency applications, you not only need the connectivity to take the data or applications from point A to point B, but you need the uh, compute also to process the data at the point B. Not only just compute to process the data, but you need the intelligence driven by AI to come up with the actionable insights on the data being processed. You see? And then you need the distributed microservices to host the applications at any location. So that is the essence of it. Essence of it is that the convergence is happening where you need the connectivity to take the packets or data or applications from source to destination. You need the compute there to process that applications at the destination. You need the AI for the inferencing and you need the distributed microservices to distribute the applications there. So when you have such kind of integration or such kind of convergence happening, what does it mean to security? How do we secure the connectivity? How do we secure the compute? How do we secure the control? Or in this case, AI machine learning data models or algorithms. And how do we secure the microservices that are being distributed? And how that security gets impacted in a distributed era where the architecture is getting decentralized. Now further to it, over the next 10 years, we are going to see more research on 6G in the connectivity layer, taking 5G into terabits per second. Then edge compute is going to evolve towards quantum computing. Then distributed AI is moving towards more explainable systems because today AI is not explainable. It's not a, it's like a black box. It will tell you what decisions it's made, but it doesn't explain what's the rational behind that. So it's very hard to secure something where you cannot explain something. 
So things are moving towards explainable systems in an AI world. And then the distributed microservices continue to progress. So the big question is that how do we secure such a, such a transition? So now putting all the things together, what does it mean to 5G, right? 5G, in the 5G world, whenever you hear something called up, NFE and SDN, what we are doing is we are taking a physical 5G network, we are virtualizing it to create multiple logical networks using network slicing. So you are just taking a physical network, you are slicing it across uh, into multiple virtual networks and each virtual network is assigned to an industrial IoT vertical. One virtual network is assigned to healthcare, second one assigned to manufacturing, third one assigned to automotive. So essentially you're leveraging one physical network across multiple IoT verticals by slicing the network into multiple virtual networks. So that's the first aspect of connectivity. The second aspect of connectivity, once you create the connectivity, you need to process the data on top of the connectivity. So that's where we are bringing the compute into different locations through edge compute and cloud native to process the data, to really address mission critical IoT applications. That's where the compute comes in. And once processing data is done, how do we come up with the actionable insights? How do we derive low latency, almost real-time inferencing and drive actionable insights into the end IoT devices. That's where the machine learning comes in. That's where the control theory comes in. Not only just taking actionable insights on the data being processed, but how do we also extend machine learning to optimize and automate the network itself? So this is how all these pieces are being put together. So the bigger question comes up is that how does security play a role when all these things are coming together? That's a bigger question. That's a bigger challenge for the industry. And when you look at it, right, you have multiple actors coming in. When I say actors means players. 5G, mostly telecom players like Vodafone, Orange, at and kind of players. Edge compute more like cloud providers like Google Cloud, Azure, AWS. Then IoT is like more industrial IoT players, more like uh, Honeywell, ABB, Schneider Electric and so on. So not only the multiple technologies are being integrated, but also multiple players and actors are coming together to realize this. So the second question comes up is, how do we implement security in such an environment where you have multiple players coming together, multiple technologies coming together, and how do we implement end-to-end -end security? Because security is something one has to think end-to-end. -end. One cannot think security in a small segment. It has to be end-to-end. -end. So that's a bigger question. So this is another way of looking at it, how 5G distributed multi-cloud for industry 4.0 looks like. As I mentioned earlier, you have multiple endpoints such as public safety, automotive, smart factories, enterprises, smart metering. And then they're all connected to various network slices on the 5G network. And they're all connected back into the clouds. And you can see the, how the applications are being distributed. So in this case, you can say, what does application means? Application means it could be as simple as AR, VR application. Suppose that AR, VR application may be sitting at the access cloud and that with that AR, VR application, you are trying to do predictive maintenance so that you can really avoid the latency and delay going all the way to the global clouds. Instead, you can process that right at the base stations. 
So now, let's look at uh, what does security mean in such a distributed multi-cloud infrastructure. So let's assume that we have multiple clouds. So what is a cloud for lack of a better term? Cloud is nothing but a connectivity, compute and control means you have connectivity there, you have compute right on top of that. You have control means AI algorithms, AI uh, framework, AI platform, right integrated. So think about in this particular slide, cloud means essentially a, a stack of connectivity, which is 5G, compute and AI. So if you see that kind of telco cloud, enterprise cloud, public cloud that's being distributed across different locations. Now the question is that how do we implement security in such a distributed multi-cloud deployments? What is our vision? Our vision is that when you are moving workloads or applications from one cloud to another cloud, how do we implement consistent security services and policies. Because you're always on the move, right? You know, when you have your smartphone, 5G phone, when you're moving, your, uh, your session is moving or your applications are also on the move. So let's say if you, for some reason, for business reasons, if you want to move your applications from GCP to any other cloud provider or vice versa, you should be able to move those workloads or applications seamlessly. But while moving it, we should not violate or break the security services and policies associated with that. So that's extremely important. So the question is that how do we federate and orchestrate the consistent security services and policies across multiple clouds, whether it is GCP, AWS, or Azure? How do we not violate any security services and policies while we are transitioning? So that's a big question. In order to realize that, we need to think about six different elements. First thing is that cloud native security. It means how do we secure the cloud native deployments? In the case of cloud native, it has got four important aspects. First thing is that it's a containerization. So we need to secure the containers. Within the containers, we have microservices that are embedded. So we need to secure the microservices. Then there's something called DevOps, develop, uh, DevOps, which is bringing the development and operations together. So we need to secure the develop, DevOps. Then the CI CD, which is continuous integration and continuous deployment, which is more agile methodology. So how do we secure that CI CD processes? So that's a sense of cloud native security. Then the second is aspect is visibility and monitoring. What's going on on the network? We should have visibility and monitoring. If we don't have visibility and monitoring, it's hard to secure. So it's important to provide that dashboard to see what's the visibility and monitoring aspect. We should be able to look at how do we orchestrate and automate the security services? How do we provide the service assurance because Security has a fundamental impact on service level agreements and the quality of experience. If there is a security attack, it will make end user unhappy or it will impact the satisfaction of the customer. So how do we provide that service assurance to provide strict SLAs, service level agreements? How do we move from rule-based static and uh, static policies to more ML-driven security analytics. How do we chain the security services? There's something called service chaining, dynamic service chaining. How do we chain the services? How do we implement AI-based intelligent threat detection and response? So I think that these are the most important thing because these six elements need to protect the connectivity layer, which is 5G need to protect the compute, which is edge compute, and need to protect the AI machine learning data models and the algorithms. 
So the past 10 years versus next 10 years. The past 10 years, when you look at uh, applications, most of the applications are monolithic. Next 10 years, applications are more microservices. So I'll give an example of uh, monolithic versus microservices just for your own clarity in case. Take an example of Uber, which is a most famous application many of us use. When Uber implemented that on our cell phones, that application, it was monolithic. What is the definition of monolithic? Within Uber, you have multiple elements, driver management, passenger management, payments, billing and charging, and trip management. All of them are monolithic. And if you want to add a credit card, for example, some new credit card to the billing, you had to upgrade an entire software. That's a problem with the monolithic. So what they have done later on, they moved into microservices. They said, you know what? One microservice is driver management that's independent of passenger management that's independent of trip management, that's independent of payments, that's independent of billing and service, billing and charging. So they created six microservices that are fairly independent. Now, if you wanna add a new credit card to some one of your payment systems, you just have to upgrade only payments. You don't need to touch other applications. So that's the beauty of microservice. Microservices is where you take application and you decompose that into more independent composable elements so that you can upgrade these applications independent of others and you can have dry you can have much more agility and service velocity so that's a big thing happening in the industry the industry is going through monolithic to microservices in big time across every industry and that's impacting the security the way we look at. The second thing is applications are migrating from on-prem to central cloud for the last 10 years. But next 10 years, we see the reverse trend, applications moving from central cloud to the edge locations. And that's driven by edge compute. Last 10 years, most of the applications in the cloud are non-real time. TCP-based applications, not really UDP-based. But next 10 years, it's going to be ultra-low latency applications, mainly driven by industrial IoT applications. Last 10 years, we have seen the formation of hyper-converged infrastructure, where AWS, GCP, and Azure, they built massive uh, um, data centers. But next 10 years, it's going to be much more decentralized Converge infrastructure where we will see micro data centers, not the uh, macro. Again, last 10 years, we have seen siloed cloud migration, application migration between the clouds. But next 10 years, uh, the multi cloud migration is going to be very important. So the others are mostly around VM based versus container. Last 10 years, we have seen more of a network management focus, but next 10 years is going to be more data-driven, closed-loop automation, AI-driven, uh, intelligent threat detection and response. So it's important to look at this past, and, uh, past 10 years versus next 10 years and how that is going to impact what we're talking about, the subject of security here. What sort of research challenges we see moving forward. So the storyline, again, the convergence of connectivity, compute, control, and con content, when that convergence is happening in a distributed way, what sort of challenges we see? The first challenge is that, how do we do micro-segmentation? How do we extend what we know, micro-segmentation of securing the microservices in a cloud-native environment? How do we extend that micro segmentation to this four layer convergence? How do we address micro segmentation to secure connectivity, compute, control, and applications? That itself is a huge topic. 
And when we do the network slicing, how do we slice that network, not just at the connectivity level, how do we slice it across compute control and content? And it do the security across these network slices. So how do we implement security across network slices? When you are providing one slice to manufacturing, the second slice to automotive, third slice to uh, home, healthcare, how do we address security and privacy across these different network slices while we are addressing multiple industrial segments? Because every industry segment has their own compliance, their own privacy rules. How do we provide that differentiated security and privacy on network slicing to different uh, end uh, users? How do we, since uh, these things are cutting across multiple domains and multiple operators, multiple actors. How do we implement security across? How do we do trust orchestration? What I mean by trust orchestration is, as I mentioned earlier, all of a sudden you have telcos, cloud providers, industrial IoT players, media entertainment, you have multiple actors. How do you do trust orchestration across multiple actors? if we want to implement end-to-end -end security. How do we do security monitoring in such a multi-domain, multi-operator, and multi-actor environment? How do we implement zero trust? Zero trust is now one of the uh, uh, key topics for the industry. So when you have such a multi-domain, multi-operator, multi-actor scenario, how do we implement zero trust? Now, when it comes to operations, we have got several, you know, we have AI ops, we have DevOps. How do we implement security across? How do we create DevSecOps? How do we uh, implement security across the operations? And how do we drive closed loop automation? Most of the security is still manual. How do we do the, uh, how do we drive closed loop automation? What's a closed loop automation? Closed loop automation means whenever the operational data coming out of network, such as NetFlow or SNMP data, how do we analyze the data to see whether that particular packet loss or traffic uh, outage, is it due to uh, uh, any security attacks or is it due to any uh, uh, fiber cut? So how do we analyze those failures through closed loop automation? And how do we drive uh, service assurance based on the security needs? And then how do we do security for AI and AI for security? That's very interesting subject. That's in fact, one of the major subjects for us. Security for AI, what does it mean? Security for AI means, okay, our data scientists, many of, many of the control theory, uh, scientists from computer science, they're all looking at how do we do uh, uh, you know, data aggregation, data mining? How do we do um, learning, training, and inferencing? But the problem is that they're not thinking about security angle. They're not looking at, okay, how do we avoid data poisoning? How do we avoid any uh, security concerns while we are curating the data, while we are training the data, while we are inferencing the data, how do we avoid any security vulnerabilities? They're not thinking about it. So it's extremely important to think about security from day one so that we can avoid any issues. Otherwise, your uh, insights are, are as good as the data. If the data is, uh, um, what do you call, data is poison, then no use of having uh, inferencing actionable insights. So it's extremely important that we connect the security with uh, AI in terms of explainable systems, as well as secure training and inferencing. La and the AI for security. AI for security is very important because the security is becoming extremely dynamic. Threat vectors are becoming unpredictable. So how can we get that dynamicity of AI 
and apply that AI principles into security so that we can proactively do intelligent threat detection and response by implementing AI techniques into our security mechanisms. So you can see, you can see this convergence is really changing the way we look at security across these four stacks. And of course, scale performance and our real time is continues to be a major thing. If we implement any security, it should be able to scale. It should be able to provide low latency and high bandwidth setups in our applications when we secure across the sports stack. So the last slide, again, I just wanted to repeat how critical this for us, the AI for security and security for AI. AI for security, the five, uh, just to repeat five fundamental components. How do we leverage AI for supply chain security? Supply chain means you have got so many players in the middle, all the way from chipset, device, networking, cloud providers, application providers. So how can we implement AI to automate that supply chain security? The second aspect is, as we move towards cloud native, how do we extend AI to do security in a software development and testing so that we can detect any vulnerabilities in the software early enough? How do we detect any anomalies, anomaly detection and response? If there are any anomalies within the infrastructure, within the applications, within the product, how do we extend AI into you know, detecting those and, uh, and uh, responding to those anomalies? Security posture management means visibility monitoring. How can we look at visibility monitoring across all aspects, servers, routers, switches, base stations, uh, um, you know, optical devices, you name it. How can we really create end-to-end -end posture management for securing these different devices using AI? and then AI-based security orchestration and automation analytics. So that's on the right side of AI for security. Security for AI is how do we secure and protect various AI data models, various AI uh, algorithms? How do we bring explainability into AI so that we can secure? How can we provide confidentiality and integrity so that we can avoid any bias? and any data model drips? And how do we provide the security assurance by integrating with the backend systems? And how can we really provide privacy as well? So that's for security for AI. I think this is a really critical subject because my concern is that we have in the industry, we have data scientists focusing on AI, we have security engineers focusing on security, but they need to come together. That's where the magic is. So just two more slides. In summary, the 5G security is a multi-dimensional problem to look at. Why it is multi-dimensional? Because 5G is introducing new use cases. New use cases means new threats coming from those use cases, mainly from Internet of Things devices. Second is 5G is introducing new architecture, means it is a distributed architecture. That means we are introducing new concepts like network slicing, control and user plane separation. Hence, how do we secure such a distributed architecture? 5G is also moving towards virtualization and uh, cloud native. So how do we secure cloud native services, how do you secure microservices, containers, DevOps, CI, CD? How do we secure that edge compute infrastructure? And 5G uses a lot of open source software. So the question is that, are there any vulnerabilities in open source software that we should be aware? 
and how can we mitigate that? And 5G leverages a lot of AI control theory. The idea is that how we can secure the data, data models, uh, so that we avoid any drift in data. Last but not least, 5G also brings in lots of actors, telcos, cloud providers, industrial media, enterprise. How do we orchestrate trust and security across these various actors? So it's a multi-dimensional problem you can see. So I would say if I'm the security researcher, these are the most fascinating times. There, there are so many problems to research and look at it to help industry more than ever in our lifetime. So end-to-end -end security, the way we can think about end-to-end -end security is that, okay, you got to secure the hardware, you got to secure the software, you got to secure the workloads that are running on the hardware and software, which we call it as cloud workload protection. And we got to secure the network and interfaces, 5G network and interfaces like radio, core, and so on, antennas, and so on. Then on top of that, we need to provide cloud security posture management, so-called visibility and monitoring, so that we know what's happening on the network so that we can proactively take action. Then on top of that, we need to think about inter, you know, orchestration and automation layer. So essentially, you can categorize end-to-end -end security at, a, uh, at 5G infrastructure and across these four layers. First layer being, how do I secure the basic infrastructure that consists of software and hardware? The second level is, how do I secure the workloads that I'm deploying on top of that infrastructure? Third one is, how do I provide the visibility monitoring so that I know what's happening across the infrastructure so that I can take proactive steps, so-called cloud security posture management? Last but not least is that, how do I automate this risk intelligence security orchestration through various AI mechanisms so that I can also take intelligent threat detection and response based on the uh, visibility monitoring and insights I receive from the underlying layers. So this is my last slide conclusion. I think the convergence of connectivity, so-called 5G, compute, so-called edge compute, and control, so-called AI, is really bringing the mobile world and cloud world to converge. And that really brings up so many unknown security challenges and research opportunities for this community to look at and help industry. Because this is something happening for the first time. It's not a 4G to 5G is not just incremental advancements. In fact, it's a more exponential advancement. So I encourage all of you to really look at not only this, but future of 6G quantum computing and AI. When 6G and quantum computing and AI are coming together, what sort of security threats and what sort of security challenges and research opportunities you see. These are fascinating times, so I would encourage you to really think that system level thinking, end-to-end -end system level security, that really opens up the new innovations and many more PhD thesis. With that, I will conclude my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Professor Christina, any, I'm open for questions. Yes, we started late, um, 10 minutes or 10, 12 minutes late or even more. So we, um, we do have uh, 10 minutes for questions. Um, this will make our break a bit shorter, but I think this will be fine. Thank you very much for this um, very broad um, presentation um, with the many perspectives you have provided. Um, I would like to start with, with one question um, from my side, which is so you've shown so many different areas where you kind of call out for research work to secure um, the, the next generation systems. And my question is um, maybe a bit bluntly, but where should security researchers start? So when you think of academic research, um, where should that start such that um, 
basically that that advancements are made in a way that then also industry will build on that. Where is it the most needed that um, more results are provided? That there is research. Um, um, yeah, basically, in which area um, would you see is that the the most desirable, such that industry can build on it? Absolutely, that's a fantastic question. One, there are a couple of areas I can think about. The first one is a network slicing. Yeah. Um, if we do network slicing across connectivity, compute, and control and content, and if we are providing those network slices to multiple uh, end users, end users being manufacturing, healthcare, and automotive, or anyone else from industrial IoT perspective, and every one of them, you know, they have their own compliances, they have their own privacy issues, they're all different from each other. So I would say one of the first immediate ones are, how do we provide security and privacy across network slicing in 5G deployments? That's a major topic, yeah. Um, the second immediate one is, how do we implement zero trust and trust orchestration uh, when the world is converging between connectivity, compute control and content? That's the second one. The third and fourth is the following, AI for security and security for AI. In other words, when we work closely with Rice Labs at UC Berkeley, where they are doing a lot of research on explainable systems. Yeah, Explainable system, many of you know already, essentially it adds explainability to AI. In other words, traditionally AI, when it comes up with a, inferencing decisions, it doesn't tell you why it has come up with that decision or actionable insight. So the idea is to add that rational on why it has made such a decision. So that's nothing but explainable system. So if we can marry the research point of view, if we can look at security in the context of explainable systems, security in the context of our distributed AI, how to uh, 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 avoid any data poisoning or how to do secure uh, inferencing and training in a distributed AI environments. They're all very interesting topics for us. Maybe as a little add on to the last part of your answer, um, when you showed the slide on AI and security, the one that you're also sharing right now, um, when we read the, the bubbles on the side, they are actually um, very general in the sense that they're the way they're not necessarily specific to 5G systems, but it's in, in general, AI used in all kinds of systems um, has these aspects that, that you described there. So the, 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 the topics that you described, we can find them in many, many areas. But are there 5G specifics to that? When we bring AI together with 5G, is there something, um, so what are the specifics to that? Um, yes, from that's an excellent question. That's an excellent question. So. The, I did not say you're right that they are 5G, they are very generic, but they're also 5G specific because the data varies from underlying system. Yeah. So the data in our case is of 5G network data. You see? So the 5G network data is completely different from a, another data. So what you're seeing in this particular uh, 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 diagram, you see the connectivity, which is 5G, right? So 5G network is generating massive amount of data in terms of logs, alarms, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So that data needs to be processed by edge compute where the, you apply AI machine learning algorithms to do the training and inference. So the answer to your question is that whenever I say data here, it's a 5G network data. That's where it is very much specific to 5G networks. Okay, thank you very much. I'm um, turning over and looking at the questions that we got from the audience. Um, I will continue with the first question and would like to motivate others to um, either write questions on the channel or um, use the raise a hand function to ask the question live here. Um, so one question we got is, um, is there a reason for why 5G is so complicated and with lots of unanswered implementation questions when it is already being deployed? 
Um, another way to ask this question um, is, are we really deploying 5G today already? This sounds a lot like 6G to me was, was one of the reactions. Um, yes, so that's an excellent question. So within 5G, there are two types of 5G networks. As you can see, I skipped this slide. The first one is called non-standalone. Non-standalone means we are leveraging the existing 4G network. Okay, so what you are seeing today, when you listen to AT&T and others about 5G, they are using the existing 4G infrastructure, but they are using 5G frequency spectrum and 5G devices. But that's why it's called non-standalone. Non-standalone is a network that uses existing 4G infrastructure. And that's what you are seeing all the announcements and all the offerings from operators. The thing that I explained is a standalone. Standalone means it's completely new network. It doesn't use any of the uh, 4G networks. Yeah, standalone is something that moves towards cloud native imp uh, implementation. So the ones that you heard me talking about is the standalone architecture, which is completely cloud native. And it's all together greenfield new architecture, okay? What you are hearing today from your T-Mobile, at and Verizon, Vodafone, all others is called non-standalone, which is leveraging existing 4G infrastructure. There, you don't see any of the issues I mentioned. The things that I mentioned are the ones that are standalone that are moving towards cloud native infrastructure. There's okay. a, uh, yes, there's a short follow up to that. Um, with the, and the question is, what is the most mature deployment plan for the core network that you have seen um, with, the, with the additional um, comment that um, the, the person asking the question doesn't really doesn't have the impression that the service providers have a proven core network design pattern um, to go at least not as much as this was the case with, with LTE. So LTE seemed to be um, uh, not so uncertain. This is the question, so. Okay, so. That is the reason service providers and uh, cloud providers are, our telcos and cloud providers are, uh, are partnering together to implement uh, the 5G core in the cloud native implementations. So um, why are they doing it? Because as I mentioned earlier, the edge compute, the earlier all the data centers, centralized data centers now are being distributed now the 5G core is now getting integrated with the cloud infrastructure from GCP and others. So because you're running the applications on top of such edge locations. So you're right that in the moving forward, there is a stronger partnership between service providers and the cloud providers in integrating 5G core with the edge compute and run the applications on top of that, applications being AR, VR, or any type of low latency applications. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I would like to ask the audience if there are other questions, please raise your hand. Um, while I say that, I have one more question that I will ask from here um, before we will soon come to the end of the session. Um, do you have... Um, or do you see some form of strong end-to-end -end security becoming part of the cellular standard? Um, so a properly implemented end-to-end -end, um, um, protected um, um, encryption being part of the, of the standard. Do you see that coming? Oh yeah, absolutely. In fact, today we have got strong encryption algorithms uh, that are being defined in our, our mobile standards, but that mainly from smartphones or the air interface to the base stations and the packet core, yeah? But beyond that, then it, it goes across the aggregation sites, co-location sites and private data centers. That's where the different types of encryption because that's beyond the radio. But we have very strict and very advanced uh, uh, cryptography and encryption schemes on the radio network itself. Um, so the, all right, thank you. The, the other, the wanted to make clarification, Professor Christina, to the first question. 
the current 5G does not assume the kind of architecture I'm showing right now. Yeah, on the slide. What I mentioned about 5G standalone is the one that assumes that you are bringing the edge compute all the way towards base stations or cell towers. Yeah. Once you bring the edge compute to the cell towers to process the applications right at the tel cell towers, then you are bringing the AI training and inferencing there to make actionable insights or, or decisions. So that stack is being called edge cloud stack, where you have connectivity due to cell towers of 5G, then you are integrating edge compute there, then you are putting AI machine learning algorithm to make decisions. So that stack is the one that 5G standalone is going to bring in some very interesting security and privacy issues. What we are seeing in non-standalone is existing 4G infrastructure where we, do, we are not at doing edge compute integration or AI integration. That's a business as usual. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Malik Tatipamula. It was, it was great to have you had in our, um, as part of our conference here. Um, I, we, we are a bit over time, so I would like to, um, to close the session now to give everybody a, a short break at least. We will then resume in 10 minutes with our last and 10th session on authentication and authorization. And um, thank you very much again. That was, that was a great talk. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Okay, let's uh, let's get started. Um, so welcome everybody to the uh, last uh, technical session at uh, this year's YSEC. I'm Kevin Butler from the University of Florida and I'm happy to be uh, chairing this session on authentication and authorization. We have uh, three uh, great papers that are gonna be presented in this session. Um, we'll do the three presentations uh, followed by uh, five minutes of Q&A for each uh, paper. Uh, please uh, make sure to use the Slack channel to ask your questions. And at the end of the uh, three presentations, we will uh, we will talk. Uh, we will have five minutes for each uh, each author to to give some Q and A. Uh, so we're looking forward to to a great session. So um, let's uh, let's get started with the first paper, which is anonymous device authorization for cellular networks. It's going to be presented by Abita Huck. This is work uh, done by uh, her and her colleagues at uh, North Carolina State University. Uh, this paper examines uh, uh, users uh, the um, permanent uh, equipment identifiers or PEIs. Uh, that are assigned to new devices, and the authors present a protocol allowing uh, mobile devices uh, to not be tracked by advertisers while providing showing that they haven't been stolen through a provably secure anonymous proof of non-membership that includes uh, RSA accumulators and zero-knowledge proofs. So lots of really great uh, crypto stuff happening in this paper. It's a really nice examination of crypto theory uh, in the service of solving a real practical mobile security problem. So I'm excited to hear about this, and uh, let's get started with the video for that paper. Hi everyone, my name is Abita Hawk, and today I will be presenting Anonymous Device Authorization for Cellular Networks. My co-authors are Varun Madathil, Brad Reeves, and Alessandra Scafuro, and we are all from NC State University. Almost three quarters of internet users will access the web solely via their smartphones by 2025, equivalent to nearly 3.7 billion people. For many people, mobile networks are the only way to access sensitive information. And so it seems that networks should provide security and privacy guarantees for its users. However, they currently do not provide such guarantees for location, activity, or identity. There are many identifiers on the user equipment. In 5G, two identifiers are exposed to internal entities, the SUPI and the PEI, which is also known as the IMEI. If you're interested, on almost any phone, you can dial star pound zero six pound, and that should pull up a screen with your IMEI. In this work, we are interested in hiding the PEI from the network. The reason we are interested in doing so is the PEI uniquely identifies a UE, and therefore it is ideal to consolidate data. Data brokers can use the PEI to, for example, show location-based ads. When a UE sends the PEI to the network, the network can then forward it to the Central Equipment Identity Registry, or the CEIR, to see whether the device is on a block list. If not, the device is allowed to access the network. But the reason a UE might end up in a block list is because the phone, for example, was stolen. And if your phone is stolen, you can actually report it and it can be put on a registry and it is then considered to be blocklisted. And if that phone tries to access the network, remember this is independent of the subscriber, it will not be allowed to do so. Hey, I, I think my phone has been stolen. There is a privacy problem with this. When the PEI is sent and the location of the cell tower is known, this information can be used by third parties. These parties could, for example, use this information to show location-based ads. That means the PEI can track someone's location. This raises the question, how can a UE authorize that its PEI is not in a block list without revealing that PEI? This problem can be solved with the use of cryptography. In particular, we are going to use the tools of RSA accumulators and non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs to prove non-membership of a PEI in the block list. An accumulator is a short binding commitment 
that represents a set of elements. One can use an accumulator and make a non-membership proof for any element that is not in the set. RSA accumulators are based on RSA groups. Their form is this. The accumulator is G, which is the RSA group element, to the power of the product of the elements in the set. Now I will describe a small example of an RSA accumulator. Let's suppose that at first the set is empty, then the element 7 is added, and then the element 11 is added. When the set is empty, the accumulator is just equal to the group element G. And when the first element gets added, we exponentiate G to the 7. Um, and the accumulator is updated accordingly. And again, when another element is added, we exponentiate again and get G to the 7 times 11, or G to the 77. So now I'll talk about how you prove non-membership in an RSA accumulator. Let's suppose that S star is equal to the product of all the elements in the set. And we want to prove that the value X is not in the set. One thing I haven't mentioned here yet is that all the elements S are prime and X is also prime. So that means X and S star are co-prime. Because they are co-prime, you can find Bezu coefficients A and B such that AX plus BS star is equal to one. The proof of non-membership is then D is equal to G to the A and we'll return D and B. So to continue the example from the previous slide, to prove that two is not in the set, we find the Bezu coefficients of S star, which is 77 in this case, and two, and we get A is equal to 39 and B is equal to negative one. So the output proof is D is equal to G to the 39 and negative one. To verify non-membership, the verifier receives the accumulator, D, B and X. And the check is D to the X times ACK to the B is equal to G. This works because D to the X is G to the AX and ACK to the B is G to the BS star. So again, with our example, G to the 77, G to the 39, negative one and two, plugging these numbers in, we'll see that the sum in the exponent ends up equaling one because of course a and b are the Bayesu coefficients and therefore you get g to the one which is equal to g and so this check works out. We see how to represent the block list using an RSA accumulator and to prove non-membership. However, to verify x is still needed which in our case is the PEI and that's exactly what we want to hide. That's where zero knowledge proofs come in. A zero knowledge proof is a method by which a prover P can prove to a verifier V that they know a value X that satisfies some property without revealing that value. In our case, we will use a Sigma protocol and the Fiat Shamir heuristic to create a non-interactive zero knowledge proof. And I'll explain what that looks like in the next slide. So here a prover is going to commit to knowledge of a value. The random oracle gives them a hash of that commitment. And using that hash, the prover writes a response. They can only write this response if they actually have knowledge of the value. Any verifier can verify the proof and accept or reject. The solution that we present in our paper is to show how a UE computes a zero knowledge proof of non-membership to prove that its PEI is not in a block list that is represented using an RSA accumulator. First, a simplified version of the zero knowledge proof. The user is going to send C, P, E, I, C, D, C, B, and a zero knowledge proof that proves a conjunction of the following. C, P, E, I is a commitment of the P, E, I, C, D is a commitment of D, and C, B is a commitment of B, and finally, that D to the PEI times ACK to the B is equal to G. Now, because all of these values are committed to, it is not possible to see what that underlying value 
is. And so now we have anonymous auth authorization. Whereas previously the UE was sending its PEI directly, now the UE is sending a proof. The AMF, instead of just checking the value or sending it onto the blacklist, is going to verify based on the accumulator, where this, the registry that keeps the blacklist is going to calculate the accumulator and send it to the AMF. Um, with all of this, the AMF verifies and can then accept or reject the UE. These proofs do add communication and computation overhead when a UE wants to authorize itself. But we'll show experimentally that the overhead is not too great and that these proofs are lightweight enough to be used in a cellular setting. The first data that we have is the time for the network to verify, revoke, and enroll. I highlight the verify time as this will occur the most often each time a UE sends its proof and it's on the order of 900 milliseconds, so it doesn't add too much time overhead on the network side. More important is the UE computation, as this is the lower powered device. The battery use is not too high, and it would take many authorizations to drain the battery. We prove this empirically with the use of a Raspberry Pi to mimic the UE, along with a MakerHawk that keeps track of the voltage and amperage use to see how much the battery would be used on a UE. Lastly, I point out the amount of time it takes for the UE to prove itself. Part of the proofs can be done offline before it ever wants to authorize itself, and this is the larger part of the proof. But the UE can hold on to these credentials and only do a little bit of extra computation when it actually needs to send a proof to the network. So in conclusion, in this paper, we showed a zero-knowledge proof for non-membership with respect to an RSA accumulator using known techniques. Importantly, we use the ZK proof so that a UE can authenticate its PEI anonymously. And finally, we showed experimentally that the anonymous authentication is lightweight enough to be used in cellular networks. Thank you for listening to my talk. I really appreciate your time and attention. And if you have any questions, you can email me or my co-author, and uh, we'll be happy to answer anything you have. Thank you. Okay, thanks uh, for the great talk. Uh, really uh, interesting material and uh, makes a compelling case for having the YSEC Oscars next year. Uh, the um, uh, we'll, we'll have, um, please uh, put your questions in the Slack channel and we'll get back to the uh, Q&A after, uh, after the last presentation is done. Let's move uh, on to uh, the next talk, which is orbit-based authentication using TDOA signatures in satellite networks. This is gonna be presented by Eric Gitterman, uh, a um, collaboration between the Technical University of Kaiserslautern and Armistice. Uh, this paper presents a system that creates authenticity signatures based on time distance of arrival measured from orbiting satellite signals to determine their legitimacy across a multiplicity of synced uh, receivers in a coverage area under an adversarial model that uh, a point adversary can spoof measurements. And uh, a simulation was uh, based on real Iridium satellite orbits and the use of real world data was considered uh, particularly useful and timely. So a very interesting talk ahead. And um, I will uh, give the floor to uh, Eric to uh, give the talk. Hello and welcome to my talk about orbit-based authentication using TDOA signatures and satellite networks. I'm Eric Jedermann from the Technical University of Kaiserslautern in Germany and one of the authors of this joint work. For the next 10 minutes, I will talk about some basics of this topic, introduce TDOA signatures, briefly explain our signature algorithm and present the results of our simulation. We are starting with a user device, here illustrated by a satellite phone, that is communicating with a satellite. The satellite may forward the messages from the user device 
to a ground station or send the data directly to another satellite. But in this talk, we will focus on the direct communication between the user device and the satellite. Or to be more precise, we will, we will focus on the downlink, which is the connection from the satellite down to the user device. The question is how the user device can be sure to receive messages only from the correct satellite and not from a spoofing satellite or from a drone that pretends to be a satellite. There are several systems out there where this is possible. One example is the Iridium system. It is a mobile satellite communication provider with LEO satellites. One part of the connection between the user device and the satellite is already authenticated. The uplink, but not the downlink. This uplink authentication is done since the Iridium company doesn't want that everyone is using their system for free. So they use SIM cards and a GSM-like communication protocol. Other GSM-based satellite systems as Turaya and Globalstar are expected to be susceptible to those threats too. For more recent LEO constellations as Starlink, Kuiper or OneWeb, it's not fully clear which encryption and authentication techniques they are using. So the question arises, can we simply add cryptographic authentication to existing vulnerable systems? Well, there are a few challenges that make it complicated. Here you can see several of those reasons why a system-wide cryptographic update is not everyone's favorite. This is the point where our proposed TDOA signature scheme starts. It could be adapted by a group of user devices without changes in the satellite system. Also, if a built-in cryptographic authentication is available, our scheme could support this by, uh, as a complementary layer of authentication. Therefore, let me explain what a TDOA signature is. Again, we are starting with a user device and a satellite that is sending a signal. Depending on the distance to the satellite, the user device receives the signal at a specific time of arrival. The same signal is also received by multiple devices at their own time of arrivals. When we set the time of arrivals of the additional receivers rel relative to the time of arrival of our first receiver, we get three time differences of arrivals, also called TDOAs. These TDOAs can be visualized in a, in this case, three-dimensional space with one TDOA on each axis. Let's call this the TDOA domain. Here you can see the TDOA measurement from the illustration with three additional receivers in the three-dimensional TDOA domain. When we are using multiple messages for the authentication, the TDOA measurements of all messages line up in this TDOA domain. And this is already the basic structure of a TDOA signature. Here you can see it more well defined where the signature T is a matrix of all time different of arrivals of the 1 to n receivers and of all 1 to m measurements. So it's an n cross m matrix. Now that we know what a TDOA signature is, we can continue with the signature algorithm. In a first stage, the algorithm determines a satellite candidate where the signal may come from. For this, it uses a satellite database. With the database, the positions of all satellites at the receiving times can be calculated. Knowing also the positions of the receivers, the algorithm now calculates the TDOA signatures of all database satellites and compares them with the originally received signature. In red are the signatures from the database and in green is the original signature. The algorithm finds the closest satellite by calculating the root mean squared error between the original signature TO and every signature of a database satellite TS. For this it uses all of the 1 to n dimensions and all 1 to m measurements. Now we have a satellite candidate from the database. In the second stage of the algorithm, it checks if the signal was sent by the satellite candidate or by drone in the direction of the satellite. Therefore, it, create a, it creates a grid of points between the satellite candidate and the user devices. For every of these grid points, the algorithm now calculates the signatures 
and compares them to the originally received signature. Here you can see how most of the blue grid point signatures are way off the original signature, but a few are closer and the closest of them belongs to the position of the satellite candidate. Let's see what happens if the signal is not coming from a satellite, but from an attacking drone. In the first stage, the algorithm of, uh, uses the light green signature of the drone and compares, them, compares it with the red database signatures. Since the drone's signature is still close to the same database signature, the algorithm would again select this satellite as a potential candidate. So in the second stage, the same grid points would be applied. But now another grid point is physically closer to the drone's position and thereby will generate a, generate a more similar signature, as you can see here. In this way, the algorithm can identify messages from drones. To analyze how good the algorithm performs and what has an influence on the performance, we made simulations and classified the outputs of the algorithm as one of four cases. True positive for correct authenticated messages, false positive for falsely authenticated and so on. They are combined in the frequently used F-beta score and this score was used to analyze the influence of the different factors on the algorithm. We did this by an analysis of variance with four factors. The factor with the strongest influence was found to be the altitude of the satellite. We made simulations with two real LEO satellite systems at different altitudes, but clearly this factor from user side is very much given. So continuing with the second factor, the diameter of the receiver distribution. During the simulation, different diameters between 1 and 10 kilometers were tested. Increasing the diameter also increases the accuracy of the algorithm. The number of messages was the third important factor. We tested numbers between 1 and 30 messages. Using more messages also increases the accuracy of the algorithm. But in practice, this would slow down the algorithm's reaction, since you would have to wait to get the required number of messages. The last factor we analyzed was the number of receivers. Surprisingly, it's the least affecting factor in our simulation. We simulated between 4 and 20 receivers. Improvements were only visible when increasing up to 6 or 8 receivers. After this, the effect was negligible. To visualize the impact of two of those factors, we can have a look at this graph. On the x-axis, you can see the distribution diameter and on the y-axis the number of messages. The f-beta score rises against 1 as the algorith algorithm gets more accurate. You can see improvements in the starting values of both factors, but for higher values improvements get smaller and smaller. So depending on your requirements and the possibilities, there will be a sweet spot between the required security and the effort to invest. To get an idea how good the algorithm performs, we made additional simulations and calculated the false rejection and the false acceptance rate. In these simulations, we only varied the distribution diameter and fixed the rest of the parameters. And this is what we got. The blue false rejection rate starts quite high at about 11%, but then drops fast for higher diameters and falls to roughly 1.2% at 10 kilometers. The red false acceptance rate already starts at 1% and decreases below 0.1 at 4 kilometers, and it remains there for higher values. So I think this shows that the approach of using TDOA signatures for satellite authentication has some good potential and is promising. Now that's it from my side. Thanks for your attention. The future Eric will be happy to answer your questions. Terrific. Okay, thanks again for uh, another very interesting talk. And as before, please uh, put your questions into the uh, Slack channel. Uh, let's move ahead now to the uh, last of the three uh, presentations, uh, which is uh, for the paper Right to Know on the Feasibility of Wrist Motion Based User Authentication from Handwriting. This is going to be presented by Ravine uh, Vijay Wikram.
and um, his, um, his work in collaboration with uh, the University of Texas at San Antonio and the University of Oklahoma. Uh, this paper looks at the problem of handwriting based authentication and uh, perhaps most importantly, looks at the question of why after much research in this area, haven't we seen a real world deployment? Um, the authors in this paper uh, collect data from experiments on handwriting motion uh, from people using smartwatches. And then the experiments uh, go into great depth uh, about the different techniques that have been studied. So that was uh, particularly uh, found uh, valuable by the uh, reviewers of the paper. So uh, looking forward to the talk and uh, let's uh, please start it off. Hello everyone, I'm Ravin Vijayvikrama from University of Texas at San Antonio. My co-authors are on India MIT from University of Oklahoma and Murtusa Jalivala from University of Texas at San Antonio. My presentation today is about our paper title, Right to Know on the Feasibility of Risk Motion-Based User Authentication from Handwriting. Various onboard sensors integrated in wrist wearables have enabled a wide variety of uh, applications other than simple timekeeping. More recently, research community have proposed systems for user identification and user authentication using these sensor data from wrist wearables. Specifically, motion data have been used to propose uh, touch input, typing, gesture-based, gate-based and handwriting-based authentication systems. The presence of unique characteristics in a person's handwriting, along with the presence of unique wrist movements have made the handwriting-based authentication using wrist wearables a useful application to investigate. But we are yet to see wrist motion-based user authentication uh, from handwriting in mainstream applications. The question remains as why? Is it because they do not perform well outside of the controlled operating conditions? Or is it because uh, their performance is not at a level to compete with other popular authentication schemes? Answering these questions is critical for understanding the reasons behind the lack of success or adoption of handwriting related motion as a modality for user authentication in mainstream applications. To this end, we uh, selected four state-of-the-art representative handwriting based user authentication frameworks from literature. And then we analyzed them using uncontrolled and unconstrained handwriting data collected from a set of human subjects under a variety of realistic writing settings. To this end, uh, we primarily try to answer four research questions, uh, how they perform in real unconstrained writing scenarios, how they perform for different writing modalities such as pencil writing, writing using a finger uh, and writing in the air. And we also, uh, evaluate how they perform under different types of ambient noises, uh, followed by how they perform under user-dependent freeform handwriting. To give a brief uh, description of the authentication model, uh, we have an enrollment phase where we use raw motion sensor data, pre-process them, and then use it to train uh, the model uh, by using both authentic and non-authentic user data. Then in the authentication phase, again, raw motion sensor data is obtained from the risk wearable and pre-processed and uh, fed into the trained model, the model will then decide if it's an authentic or a non-authentic user. Like I said earlier, we selected uh, four frameworks from literature and, uh, and codenamed them M01, M02, M03, and M04, and closely replicated them, uh, they, their original works. Uh, uh, we implemented these frameworks using uh, Python and we recruited 21 participants uh, for uh, three popular writing scenarios, namely uh, pencil writing, finger writing, and air writing. Uh, we used a Sony smartwatch and an LG G watch to collect data uh, some, uh, with the accelerometer and gyroscope data sampled at 200 Hertz. We also performed a mimicking attack. Uh, we, for that, we recruited uh, five participants, so potential victims, and then an attacker was uh, provided with the victim's uh, uh, handwritten text and a video to practice uh, before performing the attack. Before moving on to the uh, performance evaluation, uh, I want to uh, introduce the uh, primary metric that we are using. We use uh, equal error rate, which is the point at which false rejection rate equals the false acceptance rate. A lower ER uh, is a good indicator uh, of a good robust uh, authentication framework. Uh, we first analyze, uh, evaluate the authentication uh, window size. Uh, window size indicates the amount of time a user has to continuously write for an authentication attempt. As you can see uh, in frameworks M01 and M02, only air writing requires higher window sizes to achieve better performance. 
specifically uh, at 60 seconds, uh, air writing achieves the best performance. Uh, but for uh, pencil writing and finger writing, specifically in M01, uh, even at uh, smaller window sizes like 15 seconds, uh, uh, we obtain uh, ERs uh, less than 0 0.1, which makes M01 more desirable from a practical perspective. Uh, M03 uh, M and M04, the performances were rather poor uh, with ERs over 0 0.3 across all writing uh, scenarios and window sizes. Then we evaluated the effect of training set sizes. Uh, the amount of training data required for each of these frameworks. Uh, uh, if uh, it requires large amounts of training data, it may not be convenient from an end user perspective. So uh, as you can see, M01 did not have significant performance improvements when changing the training set uh, size for any of the writing scenarios. But M02, we see a considerable performance improvement when training set size uh, uh, is increased uh, about 0.2 or uh, 20 percent and specifically air writing shows a significant improvement towards uh, when using higher higher uh, training set sizes again m03 and m04 shows overall poor performance with uh, no noticeable uh, patterns uh, then we evaluated the effect of environmental noises as you can see uh, across all the frameworks uh, we noticed a demo uh, degradation of performance and in practice there could be a combination of various additional environmental noises which could pollute devices motion sensor data and further worsen uh, the performance of these uh, frameworks overall performance wise uh, we see that the er values we obtain especially using frameworks m01 and m02 are comparable with other motion uh, sensor based authentication frameworks in literature but they still lag behind uh, uh, compared to popular systems such as fingerprint or iris. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, modalities such as fingerprint or iris uh, have matured to become a reliable first factor authentication frameworks. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, motion based authentication frameworks are primarily being explored as a means of second factor or uh, continuous authentication. We then analyze how adaptable these frameworks are in terms of their potential target application, that is either convenience or security, which is done by adjusting the decision threshold. Uh, in terms of adjustability of the threshold, depending on the use case security uh, or usability, M02 demonstrate better versatility than other frameworks. Uh, uh, since as you can see, mine adjustments to the decision threshold uh, does not uh, hugely impact uh, either FAR or FRR. In evaluating the mimicking attack, we see that uh, false acceptance rate, which, uh, which uh, an increase of FAR shows uh, uh, rather successful attack. So in M01, we see uh, FAR increases for both pencil and finger writing scenarios, which worsen the ER from less than 0 0.1 to over 0 0.2. In M02, we only notice a slight increase in pencil uh, in FAR for pencil writing from 0 0.09 to 0 0.11, but we see a considerable increase for finger writing scenarios from 0 0.8 to 0 0.15. In M03 and M04, we only notice slight changes in uh, pencil writing scenario, uh, which indicates it slightly got affected by the attack. Uh, Going into details about factors that could be impacting the performance uh, of some of these frameworks, especially M03 and M04. M03 specifically uses a deep neural network based classification function, which would uh, require large amounts of training data to uh, achieve acceptable levels of performance. Uh, this may not always be practical, to, uh, practical uh, in real life uh, scenarios, which could hinder their um, uh, mainstream application uh, adaption. M04, we believe that the features are not well suited for authentication using uh, motion data corresponding to freeform writing. And we also notice other handwriting uh, specific factors, uh, uh, participant handwriting specific factors, such as irregularities in handwriting by the same user at different points of time. And then also positioning of the wrist uh, by the same user uh, at different point, uh, points of time could differ. We also notice the tendency of the wrist variable hitting the uh, surface uh, writing surface, uh, 
which all these factors uh, could uh, affect uh, the motion sensor data that's being collected from the uh, risk variable, uh, ultimately affecting the impacting the overall performance of these frameworks. Overall, we see that M01 and M02 frameworks performed on par with other motion-based frameworks in literature. They also showed to be working across different writing modalities, such as pencil, finger, and air writing. And they also show, show potential for mainstream adoption, uh, especially as continuous authentication schemes with certain trade-offs between convenience and security. On the other hand, we, uh, as discussed earlier, we see that all the four frameworks are impacted by environmental noise and could face uh, practicality issues in real life usage, hindering their mainstream adoption. Thank you. Okay, another uh, great uh, talk uh, to end the session with regards to uh, the presentations themselves. Now we're gonna move into the uh, a uh, part of um, of the session where we'll have the opportunity to uh, uh, talk in depth with each of our uh, sets of authors. So um, the um, uh, we're going to go back to the uh, first paper on anonymous device authorization. Abita will uh, be answering questions for us, and uh, as I mentioned, if um, uh, if Varun wants to be on as well, we can uh, we can spotlight him too. Uh, and so uh, let me uh, let me start by asking a, a question that uh, that I had and that also came up in the um, in the uh, chat session um, in the in the Slack session. That was about uh, uh, the question of uh, deployability. Uh, what um, uh, right? Uh, so if you need for, for and, and uh, Mertuza uh, asked this question as well. So to get the protocol adopted, uh, cellular companies need to uh, participate. Uh, and how can you get them to do that? And what are the trade-offs uh, and the advantages versus the costs that they would have to, uh, uh, that they would end up incurring? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say that uh, consumers are demanding more privacy anyway. So there can be pressure from there. Um, browsers are becoming uh, more privacy forward and they're even doing that preemptively. Um, so it seems like a thing that cellular networks might want to do also, and then they won't have to scramble later on because I think also um, the, the trend also means that um, privacy forward laws are going to appear more and more. Okay, that makes a, that makes a lot of sense. So is this, uh, what would be required, if anything, uh, from the standpoint of device manufacturers? What you're talking about sounds a lot like, you know, what Apple is putting forward in terms of their very privacy-oriented uh, view towards um, uh, tracking, et cetera. Is there anything uh, from the stand standpoint of the handset manufacturers that they could do to, uh, to ease the process or additional things that they could be adding or taking out in order to make this, uh, uh, to reduce the amount of tracking that would be even possible in the first place? Hmm. So. For only since for for now, um, since this is like a first step, we've only um, focused on the PEI so far. So like from the point of view of like the UE, like nothing really needs to change there. Just that the you know the 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 uh, protocol uh, needs to change, but the computation can be done pretty easily. Um, maybe like the one thing that needs to change is on the other side, which is like the uh, equipment. Identifier registry needs to ensure to send the uh, accumulator out and keep that updated rather than checking against the block list. So I think most of the changes are actually on that side. Yeah, and I guess from the side of uh, like app Apple, the one other thing that would change is how I guess the software would need to be upgraded to you know actually evaluate the proofs and, or create the proofs uh, you know which would be used to send to the network uh, thereafter. So yeah, so the yeah, from the protocol side, you know, maybe we can choose use whatever we have we propose in our paper to, um, you know, use in the software. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for the answer. And I think that there's a lot of interesting follow up work that uh, that, that can come out of this. So um, the other question uh, from Matuza, and we should, uh, I know it was answered in Slack, but perhaps we can expand on it a bit in here in the uh, Zoom was about. Um, uh, how would, you know, the particular uh, way, means by which you solve the problem using accumulators and uh, zero knowledge proofs. The question was, one can use private set uh, intersection or private set membership to uh, potentially uh, uh, 
uh, solve the problem. Uh, so why uh, why come up with a different construction? Um, what uh, what do you what improve what do you improve on with uh, with your particular approach in construction? That's also a great question. Um, so I want to point out first that we're doing non-membership rather than membership. Uh, but if you can uh, modify an existing private set intersection private set membership protocol to do non-membership. Um, but the main problem is that we need this accumulator to be small and we need these proofs to be small. So accumulators let us do that. And I don't think that there's, and it, it allows you to do an easy algebraic check for non-membership where like no existing private set membership uh, protocol does that um, right now. Okay. Um, so yeah, so actually that's a, that's an, I guess we'll have a one final question uh, that's not in here. So I will, I'll take the liberty of asking that. Uh, how would you foresee, um, are there things that are happening in the crypto community that you think are also uh, easily could be applicable to the notion of improving privacy, um, you know, from either the handset or the carrier standpoint? Uh, this was, to me was a really cool uh, uh, use of the idea of you know non-membership through zero knowledge and accumulators. Uh, do you think of other, that there are other other cryptographic constructions in uh, in a similar vein that could also be used to further improve uh, user privacy? Sure. So there's this. Uh, I guess you know uh, to say for you know problems like uh, so this we tackle just one aspect, right? just the PEI and then proving non-membership. So there are many other identifiers and. There's a whole bunch of say anonymous credentials that get done in cryptography, like where you know you can use so accumulate is one way to do it. Uh, stuff like blind signatures is say another another cryptography primitive that could be uh, say applied to some aspects of like just just doing anonymous authorization, and uh, where you know people can prove that they are so yeah so I'm, I'm there there are I guess other cryptography primitives blind signatures being one of them, um, anonymous credentials being another one for sure yeah. Um, I'd also add on, there's a lot of work on zero knowledge proofs and actually making them more concretely efficient. I'm a theoretician, so I'm like, asymptotically, it's fine, but sometimes it's not really fine. Uh, but people are really working on that and complaining about things like this log factor is just not okay. And as that gets better and better, I can imagine zero knowledge proofs being um, easier to put on, um, you know, even small devices like, like our uh, UEs are. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot for, for your answers. And I, I think this is a really great strand of work, especially thinking about privacy from the carrier standpoint. You know, you can do as much as you want uh, for, from the handset, but when the carrier can arbitrarily track you, as we've seen through things like, you know, SS7 uh, location tracking and all those things, you know, the, the ability to, to, uh, to prevent, uh, you know, the, to, to provide privacy from the carrier standpoint is, is, is a terrific vein of research. So uh, I hope you guys continue on it. This is uh, great stuff. Uh, thanks Thank for you. the questions. All right, uh, let's uh, now move on to um, uh, paper two and Eric is going to answer some uh, questions for us. So we'll wait for Eric to be at the spotlight. Okay, terrific. Great, uh, thanks again for the, uh, the great talk, a really interesting work. And as I said, the, uh, the fact that you're uh, using real Iridium data was, uh, was very cool. Um, so uh, we had a couple of uh, questions in the chat. Uh, again, one of them which uh, overlapped one of my own questions. Um, and that comes from um, uh, Christina, who uh, says uh, many thanks for a great talk and including intuitive uh, visualizations. Uh, can you elaborate on the attacker model that you consider? This is a question that I'd written down as well. Uh, will this only protect against uh, single location attackers, uh, for example, transmitting from one drone? Uh, or can you, uh, would your approach also be promising for protecting against uh, distributed attackers? Um, thanks for the question. That's a really good question. And um, yeah, in our model, we only considered the single source attacker. So only one drone was used for um, simulation. Uh, for simulation. Um, but this multi-device attacker is already known and is on our um, to-do list to um, yeah, simulate and to um, evaluate how it behaves because um, one of the big challenges there for the attacker is um, that he has to overcome the synchronization of our used receivers. So his signal that 
or yeah, the signals that um, he's sending has to be uh, more precise than our um, precision of the receivers to successfully fool our system. Okay, uh, thanks. And you'd um, one of the things you'd mentioned, you know, Iridium is a system where the uplink is authenticated, but not the downlink. You would also mention that other GSM systems are potentially at risk. Uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, yeah, I had a uh, um, few insights in other of these um, systems as Turaya that uh, were mentioned. Um, they also use um, GSM-based protocols or yeah, the protocol that they're using is GSM-based. Um, but they have some minor um, changes in the physical layer, how they're encoding signals and so on. So um, this is something what, that we are um, also have to consider when um, yeah, telling you that um, a system is vulnerable or not. So on the upper layer, it has the same security as the um, Iridium system. But since the encoding is a little bit different, um, that we have to look further into it and see how this behaves. And um, to get reliable results on this, we're currently on um, yeah, building a real life um, setup that is able to receive signals from Iridium and from um, other systems that are working in the same frequency area. And there we will have to deal with these uh, different encoding problems and so on. And when we are able to do this, um, when we um, have done this, then we can give you um, guarantees if this works, if this not works, and uh, yeah. Are there other um, space-based uh, signals that this uh, GPS and GLONASS, you know, sort of immediately come to mind as this <laughs> an approach that could also be potentially used for other space-based uh, signaling, uh, either currently or potentially coming down the pike? Yeah, um, basically every data that is coming down from space could be um, verified by this scheme. Um, the yeah, the problem a little bit with GPS is that we um, require the synchronization of our receivers. So um, verifying a synchronization method that we are yeah that we need is uh, kind of hard. So it's like uh, an uh, an an egg problem. Um, therefore, we focused on the um, data communication, like yeah, these mobile satellite communication providers. Makes a lot of sense. Okay, and um, we have uh, another question uh, from uh, Mertuza. Is that a nice talk? A clarification. Uh, do you assume that there are no malicious uh, TDOA measurements during the training phase? And if so, uh, how do you ensure that? Um, that's correct. During our uh, simulation, we considered that all our receivers are honest and um, thereby um, do not at least willingly fool our system. Um, however, we are yeah, aware that 100% precision doesn't exist. So we added several um, yeah, error sources like the synchronization that I already mentioned. Um, but also we added um, some um, sampling errors and so on, some internal things that will happen. Um, so if an attacking device is only um, yeah, sending minor change signals, this maybe will be covered already by these errors. So there will be no bigger influence. Um, but if an attacker is sending really completely nonsense values, um, this will of course, influence our measurement. Um, and you can imagine um, when you visualize the signal in this three-dimensional space that the original signature would be shifted on one of the axes. So um, yeah, depending on the number of receivers that are used, this influence of the attacker will be yeah, greater or smaller. Okay. Terrific. Uh, well, thanks so much for, uh, for, for taking the time to answer questions. And if there's any more questions, um, um, please feel free to uh, pose them to Eric uh, in the Slack. Uh, great. Thanks very much. Thank okay. you. Okay. And uh, for our last talk, uh, we have um, a Ravine here to uh, answer questions. Uh, 
Uh, please, uh, uh, others in the Slack channel, uh, Mertiz has done such a wonderful job over the uh, course of the uh, conference asking uh, questions. <laughs> uh, please uh, take the load off of him so he doesn't have to be answering questions for his own uh, paper. I, I actually, I, I really enjoyed uh, this talk. It was a, it was a very, uh, very cool presentation. Uh, it reminds me actually of, um, we've, uh, we've recently done some work as well looking at um, machine learning based uh, authentication mechanisms in, 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 in this case about um, device authentication. We found that many of the factors, uh, when you look at the actual machine learning that's being done, that the features are very brittle. Uh, they're, they're, they're generally open to attack. And it, it looked like some of those, uh, you, you made similar observations as well. And in, in particular, that some features are not well suited for authentication, especially those uh, using motion data corresponding to freeform writing. Uh, can, you, uh, can you elaborate on some of the other features that you found and what, what you think about the, the brittleness of these features uh, and how uh, what, you know, their suitability um, uh, as part of an authentication scheme? Yeah, uh, so that's one of the parameters that we also tested uh, in, I mean, uh, uh, in choosing some of these frameworks too. Uh, some uh, frameworks were using uh, both uh, uh, frequency and time domain uh, features, and then some were uh, that one framework which they, which used the uh, complex neural network. They didn't even use any features. They just uh, fed uh, raw uh, accelerometer data to their model. But uh, what we found out, and the other aspect was that we wanted to see if these features were adaptable across different writing settings, like pencil, finger, and uh, air writing. So what we found interesting was spe uh, specifically uh, uh, frameworks M01 and M02, they, th those features uh, do adapt uh, reasonably well uh, uh, across even these different writing uh, scenarios, uh, uh, as opposed to the other two frameworks. One doesn't even use features, but the other one, M04 features, we realized they don't uh, adapt well at all in, in any of the writing cases. Or, uh, for even uh, free form uh, handwriting at all. That's pretty much on. Uh, that's pretty much it from the feature uh, side. Uh, but the, like I said, the important observation was that some of these features could work across different writing settings. So, um, so related to that is. Um... You know, based on uh, based on your findings, do you, do you think that there is a way forward uh, for doing for successfully doing authentication? Are there are there best practices that you think you could distill based on your examination in depth of these uh, of these various handwriting techniques? Yes, uh, like I said, uh, like we said, like I said earlier, there is potential, uh, especially uh, these sensors in the smartwatches would get uh, more advanced in the future, and then some other talking about uh, in the paper was currently. Uh, with the sampling rate that we collect data for these, it's at 200 hertz, the battery life is impacted. So for a continuous authentication uh, scenario, it may not be uh, that practical if the battery drains so fast. But like I said, uh, specifically the M01 and M02 shows great potential, uh, but uh, with the advancement of these sensors and probably uh, uh, better uh, uh, battery saving capabilities in the future, we do see potential uh, in get these getting adapted, especially since uh, they can work uh, reasonably well. Uh, and they, they are on par with other motion based uh, uh, authentication schemes too. So let, let me uh, let me turn the question around a little bit because you are talking about handwriting. Have you thought about this from the standpoint of stylometry? Uh, like, could I take um, a handwritten sample and then from that, uh, would your techniques potentially be helpful in terms of determining, you know, who is it that actually wrote a written sample? Uh, so you mean we get uh, so, uh, motion data from someone and then we try to identify who the person is? Yeah, could this be a way by which, because based on the features that you're identifying, you, you know something about the way that, um, you know, uh, certain parts of the handwriting would be happening. So could that potentially be used, you know, to in order to aid in identification of, of a handwritten sample? So uh, that would, so all these uh, models needs uh, training, which requires the label training data from the user itself. So uh, if we only have random uh, 
motion data from an unknown person, I don't think uh, that's going to be possible. Uh, but uh, if we have some, if we if we have some layer, like I said, uh, we need label training data to uh, train these models. So I'm not. I don't think that's that's uh, going to be uh, uh, possible if you just have uh, uh, unlabeled data from random person. Okay, and let me ask you uh, one final question about uh, continuous authentication. Based on what you've your findings uh, from this paper and, and understanding in detail, you know the use of smartwatches, et cetera. What are what are your thoughts on on continuous authentication in general as as a mechanism? Do you think that uh, handwriting and the findings and the weaknesses that you found are indicative of larger problems with continuous and behavioral authentication systems? Yes, uh, like I mentioned earlier, one of the main problems is this is not restricted to just handwriting in any of any other uh, uh, motion based uh, authentication. One of the main uh, issues would be uh, uh, the impact for battery life and then uh, the adaptability across different kinds of noises that could impact throughout your uh, uh, daily activities. So, those are the main. Uh, uh, points that I think would impact, uh, has an impact in general for these motion-based continuous authentication schemes. Uh, but I believe uh, with the advancement of these sensors, we, we should be able to uh, 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 make these continuous authentication schemes better in the future. Okay, well, thanks. Uh, thanks again for, uh, for a great Q&A. Um, and if there are any other questions, uh, please uh, put them in the Slack and um, uh, Ravine and the other authors will be able to get to them uh, afterward. Uh, otherwise, um, they will also uh, please feel free to read the papers and to contact them by email as well. Um, thanks uh, to everyone for a, a really great session and uh, a, a great conference of technical sessions. Now I want to turn the um, I want to turn this back over to uh, Professor Popper and uh, the rest of the uh, conference team before we uh, go to break. Thank you very much, Kevin, for sharing this last session with um, paper presentations. Before we um, start with our tutorials, we would like to use the opportunity to uh, wrap up the, the, the program from the general chair side. We would like in particular use the opportunity to thank uh, the many people that were involved in making that, uh, that program and making the, the event happen this year. First and foremost, um, the technical program chairs, Leila and Rene, as well as all the members of the technical program committee who contributed to the reviewing process. We would like to thank our poster and demo chairs, Merva and Eric, who did an, a great job on making the er, demo and poster session happen online in the virtual environment. Big thanks go to Adrian and Gabriela as publicity chairs who wonderfully announced um, the, the event online and uh, tweeted about it. Our reproducibility chairs, Anjan and Brad, for chairing the reproducibility committee and assigning a re reproducibility labels um, to the papers. Um, we would like to thank our publication chair, Shujat, for his work on the proceedings. Um, Yiska um, Klassen organized the tutorials and will be chairing them as well. A big thank you for, for taking on that role. Thanks go to Raluca and Liang for their work on the website, as well as to the registration team with Nora and Hari, who did a lot of work on the registration and also other, other aspects and in, in, uh, organizations in the background. We don't stop here due to the online environment. There are many more people to thank, in particular the Virtual Space Organization with uh, Jasmine, Labiba, Ala and Nian. We'd like to thank our Zoom management team um, with Fakales, Romano, Shujad, and others that were involved with that. Big, a big, big thanks go to our audio and video, as well as the live streaming team from NYUED with Elia Channon, Manuel, Eldon, Tim, and Jonas. Special thanks go to the Center for Academic Technology with Brian, Daniel, and Richie, who stepped in last minute to help us. And thanks also go to our finance team with Hector and Claudia. This would not have been possible without you. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we were not able to welcome you on our beautiful campus this year, but we do hope that you will have the opportunity to visit us at another point in time. 
let me mention that um, at NYUAD and in particular at the Center for Cybersecurity, we are um, regularly organizing events. And let me also point out that um, we are hiring, if you're interested, um, we are hiring at all levels. We have um, positions at the faculty, postdoctoral researcher level, PhD um, student level, research assistants, engineers. Um, feel free to have a look at the link that is provided here. That's also what the QR code will, um, will uh, connect you to. Have a look to what is available and feel free to reach out to me if you're interested and would like to know more. With that, um, we are basically at the end of our wrapping up um, message. Thank you to everybody who made that happen. And do stay tuned for updates on next year's ACM WISEC 2022 conference. We will announce it as soon as information is available on our current website. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone once again for attending WISEC so far. And I would say enjoy the next tutorials and workshop.
So, hi everyone. This is going to be the tutorial program, which is part of ISEC. And today we are going to start with a GNU radio tutorial, but there will be way more tutorials tomorrow. So there's seven tutorials scheduled. They are on uh, software defined radios as of today. So that's the first one. And then there are more. Uh, the first blog will be about everything that is related to firmware. So firmware reverse engineering, fuzzing baseband, rehosting firmware. The next part will be in between firmware and operating systems. So this will be about uh, Bluetooth firmware modification and fuzzing Bluetooth with Frida. And then in the end, we will have two more tutorials, one on a 5G testbed. And the last one will be about publishing your open source research tools. So the overall tutorial format will always be 30 minutes uh, for the tutorial. And then there will be 10 minutes live Q&A where you can ask the people questions. And I really encourage you to ask questions because all of the tutorials are given by people who contributed to these tools or even developed them as a main developer. So this is your chance to ask questions on real world tools um, yeah, and you can, of course, watch all of this live on YouTube, but you can also ask questions on Slack or ping me on Twitter if you have anything. So, uh, and with this, we are going to start the first tutorial, uh, which is programming software defined radios uh, with Kim Radio. And you can find more description on all tutorials uh, on the other side here. So you can just scroll through this and just check this out if you are interested. Uh, all right, I hope this works so that anyone can now uh, see the first tutorial. Um... Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining the session. My name is Bastian Blössel and I'm a postdoc at the Secure Mobile Networking Lab at TU Darmstadt in Germany. And I'm also involved in the GNU Radio project, which is an open source real-time signal processing framework that we'll also use today to implement our own receiver. So the idea for this session is to provide a brief and hands-on introduction to software-defined radio, presenting a workflow where we um, reverse engineer and decode an unknown wireless signal. And I think the interesting aspect about this workflow is that it uses popular and well-maintained software, and it's really um, very low level and looking at the nitty gritty details. That means we look at the physical waveform and derive the parameters of, of it. And just saying this because I'm aware that there is um, software that would allow to automate parts of this process and would, would allow us to also work on a bit of a higher level. But um, I still think it makes a lot of sense to at least go through this process once to know what's going on under the hood. Okay, so to make sure that we are all on the same page and also to have this a bit self-contained, I wanna give a very brief introduction to software-defined radio. And I usually like to introduce software-defined radios as a piece of hardware together with a piece of software. And conceptually, this is very similar to audio processing where you have speakers and a microphone that is connected to an audio interface. And this allows you to send and receive acoustic signals. In the case of an SDR, we have a radio front end with an antenna and A to D converters, and it allows us to digitize the electromagnetic waves. And again, this is combined with a piece of software where we implement our digital signal processing and implement our own transceivers. This implementation, implementation can be on an FPGA, a GPU, or a CPU, or a combination of all of this. But today, we'll only look at the CPU uh, implementations based on GNU Radio because they are by far the most accessible ones, even though they then have limitations with regard to delay, chitter, and high performance, high throughput applications. Okay, so if we stick to the comparison between audio and radio once again, then I think there are two major differences. For one, with radio, we consider much bigger bandwidth. As a human, we hear between approximately zero and 20 kilohertz, so we have a bandwidth of 20 kilohertz. And um, with RF already, for example, a 20 megahertz Wi-Fi channel that was already around in 2000 or so um, was a factor of 1000. And now we consider 40, 80, 160 megahertz channels. And the same is for, goes for cellular, basically. And what it means is we have to sample faster to capture the full bandwidth of the signal, which results in a lot of data, which has to be processed, and this can be a big challenge. 
And the second difference is that radio is usually not sent around zero, but up converted to a certain frequency band. And this is what I try to depict here in this simple figure, where we have a real value signal, and that's the orange part, and it's real valued, that means it is symmetric around zero, and it has a given bandwidth, and is sent on a certain band, a frequency band. So that could be 20 megahertz bandwidth of a Wi-Fi signal that is sent on 2.4 gigahertz, for example. Now the question is how we sample this and how the SDR processes this to, to receive the signal. And while direct sampling is about to become feasible, um, the vast majority of um, SDR hardware out there still has an analog down conversion stage. And what you could do in theory is you could down convert the signal as depicted here at the bottom on the left, that it's still a real signal send it at around zero and in this case, you would have to sam sample the real valued signal with twice the bandwidth. And I guess this is what rings a bell, what everybody knows. It's the sampling theorem that says um, to capture a signal fully, you have to sample it twice the bandwidth. But this is actually not what an SDR is doing. And this was irritating me a bit in the beginning because an SDR down converts the signal, um, send it at around zero, and, but it's no longer symmetric. So that means it's now a complex analytic signal. And it's what we call the complex baseband representation of a signal. And now in this case, you, have, uh, you only have to sample with a bandwidth, but have complex samples. So it, in a sense, it still makes sense because it's the same amount of information. It's the same data rate. It's just a different representation in the end. For the hardware, that means you can either have one A to D converter or two running at half the rate. And this is what the SDR is doing. So basically what it means for you is when you turn on your SDR and it will down convert to complex baseband, it will stream complex numbers to you. And if you set a sample rate to 10 mega samples per second, you get 10 megahertz worth of bandwidth. Okay, and this is already everything I wanted to say as an introduction. And now we switch to the more hands-on part of the session. So today I have a HackRF1 on my desk, but nothing we do is in any way specific to this particular device. So you could just use any other SDR radio for it. I just think the HackRF is a good example of an affordable software-defined radio. It's about 300 euros that can be used to send and receive signals of uh, up to 20 megahertz of bandwidth. And it basically covers everything below six gigahertz. So that's for this price, a pretty flexible device. And the first thing I want to do is use it as a spectrum analyzer. It basically allows us to explore the signals around us, kind of scroll through the spectrum, let's say. And for this, I want to use phosphor. And the interesting thing about phosphor is not only that it looks nice, but also that it uses the GPU to accelerate uh, signal processing. So in this case, you can see that it found my NVIDIA GPU and uses it to calculate the FFT and render this plot. And the FFT obviously is used to um, convert between time domain as uh, streamed by the SDR to the frequency domain representation that is now shown on the screen. Okay, so let's dig a bit deeper into um, phosphor. First of all, we can increase the sample rate. As I said, this device supports up to 20 megahertz. So now we see a bit more. And now we can just scroll a bit through the spectrum and see if there's something interesting that pops up. Okay, here at about 1.88 gigahertz, we see that should be a UMTS cell, so 3G cellular. If we go down, further down, here are some GSM cells, so we see this more narrow signals. And if we go further down, yeah, here, for example, we have some LTE cell. As I mentioned, we have 20 megahertz of sample rate. We see 20 megahertz of uh, bandwidth, and this is a 10 megahertz uh, LTE carrier. So for example, if we now uh, reduce the sample rate, it's like zooming in on the signal. So exactly, just to give you a bit of impression how that works. And um, now also, I guess LTE is a good example to demonstrate why phosphor is not only eye candy, but actually it also has um, some advantages. Because for example, here, um, we can see the, the LTE carrier in great detail, and we can even see uh, or get an idea of the resource blocks and which are used and which are free in this case. So this is clearly an advantage of uh, Phosphor when we are really able to process all the data that we receive from the SDR without dropping something. 
Okay, so what else can we have a look at? For example, we can go to uh, 100 megahertz, well, that's FM radio, and with, if we go to close to 100 megahertz, then we can see with our 20 megahertz, we can see all radio stations basically because it spans from 88 megahertz to 108 megahertz, so this is exactly 20 megahertz. We see all of it. Okay, so that was the first impression um, of Phosphor, but what do we want to use it for today in the tutorial? So I want to use it to decode a wireless car key fob. And I got one of those um, for my car and I was curious how they work. You can see these fobs are from Hella. I bought another one that I cracked open just to see what's inside. It was not too interesting, but still. Um, yeah, today we want to use the my actual one. And the first thing, obviously, uh, the question we have to answer is so on which frequency is it sending? And Hella, in this case, it made it very easy because it's printed on uh, on the key fob itself. In this case, it's on the 4 430 megahertz. In the US, they sell the same key fobs. I think it's the 330 megahertz band. Okay, so let's go to FOS4. Or maybe I'll, let's look at everything. Here you can see my key fob. Now we first tune to um, 433 megahertz, for example. And then um, when I press it, yeah, I can clearly see it in the spectrum looking very nice. Now what we can have a look at is, for example, setting different gains. In this case, okay, it's looking pretty good, but let's see what happens if we increase the gain. And at some points, you see the noise flow goes up a bit and we get copies of the signal. So in this case, it's clearly overdriving it. You don't want to avoid this. So you usually try to reduce the gain. Uh, you increase it as much as possible, but you want to avoid overdriving it. Okay. so. We found our signal looking pretty good. It's, I suspect it's pretty narrow band. So the next step would be to record the signal so that we can inspect it more closely because in this case, what you see it's there, we can, we can approximate its bandwidth, but that's basically everything. So since we are oversampling here currently like crazy, we can reduce the sample rate a bit. Let's say we go down to eight megahertz or so like this. And then um, we can record the signal. And fortunately, this uh, um, spectrum analyzer already supports this. So we can make a recording. Here's a recording button. And now I have to be a bit fast because recording it uh, with this high bandwidth produces quite a bit of data. So I will now press open, close, and the trunk button each three times and then stop the record. So here, start the recording. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. And stop. Okay. So now we recorded the signal and can now move on and have a inspect it more closely um, to figure out the system parameters. Okay, so now we can go ahead and perform an offline analysis of the samples that we just recorded with Phosphor. And for this, I want to start in Spectrum, which is an awesome tool that was just created from, for that. We can open our file in the temp folder. And usually the only thing we'd have to adjust is the sample rate, but in this case, it already guessed it from the file name probably, because 800, uh, 8 megahertz is already correct. And what we have now is a spectrum over time. So that means we have time on the x-axis and uh, frequency on the y-axis. So it goes from minus four to four megahertz. So that's also fine. And with uh, regard to phosphor, where we had this waterfall blot, it's kind of 90 degrees rotated. Okay, so let's just start and scroll a bit through the spectrum. And there we clearly see some transmission. Mm -hmm. As we can see, it's not really in the center, but it's kind of offset. It seems to be like um, 1.1234, um, 1, 5, so 1.45 megahertz offset was the higher frequencies, which also kind of uh, matches with what we've seen in phosphor. That was also not in the center, but a bit shifted um, towards the right. So this probably is our key fob. We can now zoom a bit out and uh, 
a bit uh, that's eye view of it so let's see here it starts here okay, and there are transmission small gap transmission and then a small gap and another one and this is kind of nearly back to back um i couldn't press the key this fast so probably it means that when i press the key it sends out the opening or closing the code um, multiple times just to increase the chance that my car actually receives it and then acts upon it so that means i would expect that one key press corresponds to such a burst let's call it of transmissions um you remember the three keys i pressed each of them three times so if we now scroll through this um we should see nine of those first so let's go first two three four five six seven eight nine and then that's it okay so at least that already makes some sense then let's have a closer look at the actual signal so we zoom in a bit and we can see that it looks like there is something like there's a carrier and there's nothing there's a carrier well, it's turning it on and off so it suggests that this is uh, on off keying a very simple modulation technique that is on the other hand really common in this uh, frequency band and for this type of devices for example wireless weather stations or so would also often use it okay so and this is on off keying we are mainly interested in the amplitude of the signal and fortunately in spectrum allows us to add a derived plot um, to the, to this one of the options is add amplitude plot so i do it and we can select part of the spectrum where we are interested in and filter it out and then if we scroll to the bottom we hopefully see a plot of the amplitude with a filter here we can adjust it a bit more like this it looks good i'd say and what do we see here a very regular pattern on off on off on off uh, yeah it goes on for quite some time and i mean it's clear that doesn't convey any information i uh, at least i hope it doesn't that this doesn't open my car um but this is usually a synchronization sequence like preamble or sync word however you want to call it and I expect that the actual data is in someone later. This is incredibly long. Very long. Okay, so this uh, seems to be the more interesting part of the transmission. Can we zoom out even further? Yeah. Okay, so we see that here's a long preamble and then here something is happening. Now, um, we can have a bit of a closer look uh, enabling cursors and this gives us an overlay where we can easily measure things so place it around this and then add um, a bit more and try to align them um, with the symbols that we see here this looks pretty good i would say yeah okay so now what do we see now we have this preamble sequence or synchronization sequence and then here it starts to that there are sometimes two consecutive uh, zeros and ones but also if we have a bit of closer look at it what's really strange is that there are only at max two consecutive zeros and ones and actually this is strange because we would assume there is some security involved and there should be kind of an equal uh, distribution and independent of zeros and ones it doesn't seem to be the case here at least um so but one of these uh, explanations for this is that um, the key fob probably uses manchester encoding and the um, specific thing about manchester encoding is that it's not each of these uh, symbols that we see here that encodes a one or a zero but that you always have to consider pairs of them and with manchester it's guaranteed that in, um, in each pair there's a, either an upwards or downwards transition um, between those symbols and this then encodes a zero or a one what that means for us is okay 
when we have a closer look here, we see that here are two consecutive zeros and here are two consecutive ones. And that can be that this is a pair of this Manchester encoding bit bit. So it means we have to align it like this, that this is a pair with a downward transition, this is a pair with an upward transition. So it's very clear how we have to align it. And this is why Manchester is often called a self-synchronizing code, because just from have, seeing a gap with two consecutive zeros and ones, we know exactly where we have to align our bit, basically. Okay. So this is already most of the things we uh, wanted to find out about our signal here within Spectrum. Um, one thing we still have to have a look is um, these um, parameters that are derived um, from our grid. And we can see that there's a simple period of 295, let's say, microseconds and a simple rate of 3.39 kiloboard. Um, so as I said, the samples, uh, the, the bit rate would be half of that. But yeah, so we can um, basically, we have to write down these parameters and remember them. To summarize, what we learned here is there's our signal, it's offset 1.45 megahertz and towards the higher frequencies. It's on off keying. On top of it, it uses a Manchester encoder and the baud rate is 3.39 kilo baud. Okay, so with this knowledge, we can now go ahead and try to build a receiver with GNU radio. Okay, so we derived the most important parameters of our signal and can now go ahead and implement the receiver in GNU radio. I already started the graphical use interface to GNU radio and started to put something together. GNU radio supports this concept of blocks that can be connected to form a flow graph. And a flow graph is the standard thing that can be actually run and executed. So the whole thing here would be one flow graph. In our case, we start with reading from a file. Obviously, this is the IQ sample file that we just had a look at. So we're read, reading this in and looping it all the time. By default, this would happen as fast as I/O the disk uh, permits. So we throttle it down a bit. And in this case, I adjusted a rate of 8 mega samples per second so that it matches the rate of the hardware. And speaking about the hardware, it is very easy to disable these blocks so that we gray them out and enable a block that interfaces the hardware, so the HackRF, so that we could switch between either reading from the file samples or really reading samples uh, in real time from the hardware. So this is uh, very nice. Um, but for now, when we really still work on the receiver, we use the file source because then we don't have to press the button all the time and it's just easier to handle. Okay, so the first block that actually does some signal processing um, is the frequency exciting fear filter here. And it does quite a lot of things. The reason is not that we don't like modularity, but it's just efficient to do all of this in one step. So what it does is it, first of all, compensates for this offset. It moves the uh, key fob signal down towards the center. So it compensates for this 1.45 megahertz. Then it also low pass filters because it's just a narrow signal and it can filter out all the noise at the edges of the spectrum. And finally, the signal is heavily, heavily oversampled. So um, we decimate, so that means we reduce the sample rate by a factor of 32. And that means the input rate of this block here is 8 mega samples per second, and the output is 8 mega samples, uh, mega samples per second divided by 32. Okay, now we can already have a look and see how that looks after this stage. And for this, I added a frequency sync, so we can still have a look at the spectrum. Here we see um, the low pass filter, so we only get some noise in the middle. And then from time to time, we see these transmissions. And these transmissions are now really pretty close to zero, so we compensated for this um, big offset. Okay, so this is what we expected after this stage. So now we want to decode our on off keying signal. And for this, we first of all calculate the magnitude of these complex numbers, because we're only interested in the magnitude. And here it's interesting to have a look at the color of the ports of this block. The input is blue, which indicates that this is a complex uh, samples, and the output is um, orange, which indicates that this is a loads or real values. So that makes sense. And then after that, we only are interested if it's on or off. So what we can do is just uh, 
define a threshold and everything above the threshold is a one, everything below the threshold is a zero. This is exactly what the block does. I already had a look at the um, signal levels and adjusted the threshold so that it works pretty good um, with our recording. With a real system, you probably want to have a dynamic so that you adjust the threshold based on the preamble values, for example, so that you, um, if the signal gets weaker, that you adjust the threshold accordingly. But for our use case now, that's good enough and um, can be improved later. Okay, so let's also have a look at this um, and see if it works. And here, let's see if we can stop. Oh, yeah. Um, we have here two signals. The red one is the one of the output of the complex to magnitude block. Here it's kind of the analog signal where um, there's some noise. And the blue one is then the binary signal that only changes between 0 and 1. And we can see that when we see here um, these transitions uh, of the red line, then also it switches from 0 to 1. So that means the threshold is, uh, is working. And now and we'd also uh, only need a block that looks at these binary values and uh, implements a decoder for our key fob. Obviously, um, yeah, GNU Radio just provides the base, the blocks that are very common in every SDR application. But here we reach a point where we just need something custom for this particular technology. So that means we have to build, uh, implement our own GNU Radio block. And that's what we'll do in the next step. Okay, so as a last step, um, we now create our own GNU Radio block that can de then decode the signals from the car key fob. And with GNU Radio, this can be done with an out of tree module. And usually this requires tons and tons of boilerplate, but fortunately GNU Radio shops with a tool that helps us um, with this. And this is called gr underscore mod tool. And we can say, just say new mod, call it key fob, and then we have a new gr key fob um, directory. This already creates quite a lot of stuff, but actually it's not really interesting because there's no module and uh, no block. And we just add one and call it decoder. We say it's a sync block because only has an input, but doesn't add, we don't add an output. Do it in C++, it's a bit faster. And no arguments, everything's hard-coded. And also no uh, QA test for now. Okay, so now we see what files were created. And the most interesting one is the impl.cc, the decoder impl.cc. This is where all the DSP is going. So let's open this plug in our editor. Um, yeah, and the template is really so nice that it also includes pragmas with messages telling you, oh, look, here you have to <laughs> write some code. Um, basically, it tells us we have to set the input type. And since we already kind of in binary domain, we can just say this is, this is a byte. And then the other thing we have to change is the work function. This is very famous for GNU Radio. Usually the work function is what implements the signal processing where you get a, this input, you get an input buffer and you have output buffers and you just uh, implement all this logic that um, takes the input samples, does something, produces the output samples. In our case, it's very easy. We just cast the input samples to, um, to bytes and then implement the Manchester decoder. And for this, I already prepared something because we don't have the time to do it live and it would probably be a bit embarrassing to see me um, type while talking. And I implemented it pretty ugly, but in a way that I only now change the work function and nothing else. This is just to can put it in the stream and that you know that it's not like I have to change uh, something at 10 different places. So this implements the Manchester decoder and the logic is quite simple. So we cast the, the input items to um, our bytes, we iterate over all of them, and then we check how long strings of zeros and ones we see. Either this corresponds then to a short pulse, a long pulse, which means there's two consecutive zeros or two consecutive ones or something else. If something else, we just ignore it, assume it's maybe noise or something, just do nothing. If um, we see it's a long one, we know we are misaligned. We don't output something, we just shift our kind of bit border by um, the symbol width. If we only see, we see these um, short pulses, um, two consecutive ones with a positive edge in between, we output a one. If we have two consecutive ones with a 
negative integer in between, we output a zero. And this is basically all the logic. And the difference of this short or the, the length of this short and long pulses, it's basically derived from the sample rate and the um, symbol duration that we um, uh, wrote down in, in Spectrum. So we have, we, here we already have the whole implementation of our decoder. And now we have to do two additional steps. Apart from this C++ implementation, New Radio also has Python bindings. We have to generate them. This can be done um, also with GR module. Um, bind the decoder. So um, this should create the Python bindings for it. And finally, um, all blocks come with uh, a YAML file. And the YAML file is basically the description for the GUI. And it tells us how many input ports it has and so on and so forth. So this YAML file is in the GRC directory. And here we can create a very simple one. We don't have any parameters. Our block, our block also doesn't have any outputs. We just have a single input that we have to fill in. So we call it in. It's a stream block, means there's a, just a normal buffer. The data type is called byte, vector length is one, and we don't need this. So basically, this tells us how a block can be instantiated. So we just import our module and then call the constructor, and that's everything. And each of these blocks only has one input. So this is everything we have to do in GNU Radio to um, have our own block. Now it's just like a normal CMake project. Um, we can configure, build, and install it. And then hopefully it shows up in the GUI. So so it's installed. Okay, here's our flow graph. And now we get this new um, category here, and it says key fob, and we only have a decoder block. And we can add it to the flow graph as input. This uh, lila um, pink uh, violet ones correspond to a, a byte and connect it. And I already changed the file source to not repeat. So we play our recorded signal only once, and then let's see what happens if we get some zeros and ones out of it. OK, so something is happening. These long strings of zeros correspond to the preamble. And other than that, we got quite a lot of bits. And yeah, let's just use the editor to have a look at them. Um, we can mm, delete the leading zeros, basically. Um, OK, let's list us with this. And there we can see, OK, at least it looks a bit like they make a bit of sense. We uh, compare it here. These three are the same. So this was one button press resulting in the same key sequence. That's nice. The second one. Third one, so we should see nine of those. Here were only two transmissions. Yeah, so that makes sense. So here we have our nine. Now, um, the other thing we can have a look at, we know the first three one were all ones where we op try to open the car. And if you look a bit closer at the sequence, we can see that the command or the button that we press is indicated at the uh, in the last bytes of the transmissions. So for example, here we see this first three were all closing, the second three were all the trunk uh, button, and the other one was to open. So we can see we received something, otherwise it uh, wouldn't happen that you out of chance receive the same sequence several times. We can see that they have all the same length, that makes a lot of sense. We can see that um, that also the uh, type of the um, key is indicated in this bits. And so we could work from there. So um, the rest is hopefully not so easy to derive because somewhere in there is a rolling code that uh, is then the secret um, so that only this key can open the car. OK, so we really rushed through this whole process now. I still hope that there was something in for you. And if you still have questions, then feel free to ask them during the Q&A. Other than that, I thank you very much for your attention. And yeah, bye bye. Oh.
Hi. Uh, the first question was a bit more general by someone on YouTube uh, no, twi or Twitter, and they asked um, if the recordings will stay online. And yeah, they stay online, so you can also watch this later. And now with the first question to Bastian. So uh, you're very, very close to developing stuff with GNU Radio and implementing new features. What is the next big feature that we can expect to be there? Uh, so, so with GNU Radio, there's always two things. So one is the GNU Radio framework, which kind of provides the base for your own implementations. Uh, and then there are out of three modules that usually then implement a specific technology like Wi-Fi or like this car key for Pop uh, uh, some very simple example for this. And yeah, so that's the question what um, from the, the framework, um, we are currently trying to improve the integration of accelerators for example, like GPUs and FPGAs, um, because obviously, as I also mentioned in the video that, um, yeah, um, you know, bandwidth are getting bigger and bigger and you have to process a lot of data. So the question is really how to make good use of it, how to integrate it in a flow graph. Mm -hmm. So that's from the, um, yeah, from the frameworks perspective. And from out of tree module, I don't know what, who will be the next to publish a cool module. Yeah. I mean, there were one um, from, for example, from the DARPA challenge who brought, um, who had an example for a very, uh, yeah, robust modem that they uh, open source. Um, yeah, that is one, for example. Mm -hmm. So Tony just asked a question and uh, he wants to know if there is any kind of, yeah, library of signals or recorded stuff. So if you don't have an SDR, uh, like just signals that you can look into. So yeah, there's. Um, I think there's a wiki um, with recordings, a sick wiki. Uh, I'm not really sure. Um, but what you can also do, there's web SDR uh, by some amateur radio uh, operators. Or there are some fancy setups with big antennas where you can just tune in uh, on the web and then um, either do recordings, live stream the audio to you and stuff like this. So I was playing around with some in simple amateur radio modes like a BPSK32. PSK32, I guess it's called. I already forgot. And I was streaming the audio um, from the web SDR to my host and uh, connected it to the radio and then could even have this live decoder running locally from the samples that I received from web SDRs. So that is one idea. But also to say, if you, for example, for this key fob, you can also use an RTL SDR, which is a maybe 10, 20 euro SDR, which it's receive only goes up to maybe a bit above, so let's say two gigahertz and only two, three megahertz of bandwidth. Um, but so this is a very, very affordable start into this domain. And this um, key fob thing, you could have done with the RTL STR just as well. Yep. Awesome. That's a great idea to get started. So it's not that expensive to start uh, with an RTL STR. Uh, I also have a couple of them, and it's always great to hand them to students. Um, so Marius just asked, uh, so whenever he's using GNU Radio, there's like a ton of basic blocks, and he has like no good idea. Or is there like something to know where to start with? So if you, if you have like hundreds of basic blocks, which one should you use in a certain scenario? Are there any recommendations or how to's? That goes then really into kind of studying like communications engineering and stuff um, where you mm -hmm. usually know how the receiver looks and then usually you find a block that does this, what you heard from the lecture, let's say. Um, but there was uh, in the past another issue that there were tons of blocks and they were really not well documented. Um, but now this changed a lot. And there's in GNU Radio, there are now people who are really focusing on documentation and also the integration from the GUI, like you know it, for example, from... Um, uh, commercial frameworks where you can just uh, right click and say go to documentation and something like this is all. So I'm not sure how mm -hmm. fast it is, but um, how, how far we are. But usually it's now very well documented in a kind of a wiki page per block so that you at least get a very good idea of how it's used and with examples. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So I mean, even if I would now get, let's say, an RTL SDR and want to get started, is there something you would recommend as a target? So is there like one IoT gadget or something different that I should buy if I've never been using it? 
Yeah, so, so some of these um, like wireless weather stations use uh, usually this simple on off keying and they shall some can be easy to uh, reverse engineer. In the mm -hmm. past, I also looked at uh, wireless traffic, um, uh, traffic lights or um, telemetry from um, buses that are driving through the city. This is all very, very, very simple um, modulations and uh, it's pretty doable to get out the frame structure then. I have one more question. So because you said like these are all super simple signals, what is the weirdest thing that you ever uh, decoded with an SDR? So uh, and not, not the weirdest, but I, um, I once uh, was uh, walking through the forest and found a uh, from a weather balloon uh, lying on the uh, on the ground, and I uh, yeah took that with me and. <laughs> Um, yeah, powered it on again, and then was trying to receive the signals. But I, and I also found some uh, guys who started a GNU radio module. So I picked this up and extended it, and then in the end got the uh, temperature, humidity, everything from this um, uh, weather balloon that I found. Uh, this was pretty cool. Awesome. So there is also Malta, and I think he he just asked if you could provide uh, maybe. Uh, a recording or something of the car key. And I think you even have a virtual machine for this, right? So is there, did you publish the virtual machine anywhere with all the tools set up? Okay. Yeah, there was a kind of a longer version where we, that we had a lecture on it. Um, but I also um, kept the recording that I, this particular one from the video so that I can publish it. Um, so that wouldn't mm -hmm. be an issue here. Yeah. On the other hand, by the way, so this is actually a broken there was a paper on it people know how this looks and um yeah there's a master key for all keys so actually <laughs> you could then uh, open my car if you derive the if you know the master key so you <laughs> made yeah, the recording I not, not I with mean, the card <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you, you made the recording mean, with your own car or sure? with the one <laughs> Really? So, I mean, then the tutorial was successful if you managed to um, <laughs> open my car <laughs> So that's uh, the hidden CTF challenge. Exactly. Awesome. I think with this, uh, the, yeah, I have no more questions, but uh, yeah, so the tutorials will continue tomorrow. I can try to share my screen again to show all of them. Let's see. Huh? Yep. But no, nope, that's not the one i mean does it work do you see my screen yeah okay yeah. <laughs> all right um so yeah so tomorrow it starts uh with all the firmware topics so gitra base safe and avatar 2 and then continues with bluetooth and in process fuzzing which will also focus on bluetooth and then we have the 5g testbed and reproducibility um so yeah i'm really looking forward to this uh and yeah so that's it with visec for today but as i said it will continue with the tutorials tomorrow see you bye